I live surrounded by the forest, about a mile away from a haunted lake. I have recurring and painfully vivid nightmares of what I always assume are wendigos and skimwalkers, staring into my window or coming out of the woods or coming into my home almost weekly. Prior to these, I haven't had any nightmares since I was perhaps seven or eight. I never ever knew of the idea of humanoids before these nightmares began. They're actually the reason I've been researching everything the past few months. I've heard some creepy stuff at night as well, notably when I'm outside in my hot tub at around 1 to 3 a.m. and can hear large branches snapping closer and closer to my house and scuffled steps. I always assumed it was an animal, but now I'm not so sure. July 13th, 2017. My friends and I went to get ice cream at night. Snapchat says it was around 10pm when the photos were taken, so it was within the 9.30 to 10.30 time frame. I live in a heavily wooded mountainous and desolate area of southern Pennsylvania. I am actually in the Lycan Loop, an area where humanoids and supernatural creatures are often reported in Pennsylvania. I also live about a half hour away from both Camp David and Raven Rock Mountain. Fun fact, I've been to Camp David, and it's a pretty creepy place. Some believe that humanoids could be due to the government, which is why I've included it. Anyway, we were driving back home from getting ice cream and just having fun, and I decided to take photos of my friends in the back seat. I was probably snapchatting someone, and just sending photos back and forth. I took two photos, and in the first one something creepy appeared in the rear window. I immediately saved it, and looking back at the window, but neither me or my friend in the back could see anything. I took another picture for good measure, but it was no longer there. I took these pictures in total darkness with flash on. I highly doubt this could be some sort of reflection or glare. There's no glares or reflections on any of the windows or any of the photos. In any other circumstances, I take photos like this. I see no glares or reflections. That being said, why is the face so bright and easy to see? Was it just a trick of the phone? I'm a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So of course when I decided to go to college, I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was a must. Upon checking a couple of places out, I decided to go to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, or just the borough. The biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there and was a well-known name in the community. He owns to this day a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. That's all I really needed to pick the college I would be going to. Edinburgh is really cool because there are lots of old buildings and strange flat landscapes as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to figure out how to scout the game that I'd be going after once the season started. My main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was truly a thing of beauty. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that we found in the woods behind the house. As I was scouting the area for the first time, I came up on a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. They were definitely very old. The boulders were quite big, much too big just to be moved there for some reason, like a group of guys came camping out. 
they must have taken at least 10 men to move, and only if they'd have had some kind of pulley system or something. There were also smaller rocks, and when I say smaller, I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more, making inner circles inside of the large boulders. I found a total of seven of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks that were now part of the chimney, they simply had to be with the amount of rocks he used on them. Oh, and also these rock circles had made a much larger circle around the woods. After a few more days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure we had our spot picked out for our first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there. Perfect day too. It was great. The thing about Edinburgh is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska, due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. What happens is before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way up high into the atmosphere, too high for them to actually snow due to the low temperature all the way up there. The clouds then come inland and fall back towards Earth. It takes them about 20 miles to do this, and Edinburgh is about 20 miles from the lake. You see what I'm saying. Anyway, on the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow. This is perfect for archery, because you can see deer in the woods much more easily, and you can also see if any animal has left any tracks. If they did, they were fresh, since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about two hours or so, neither of us had seen anything. I had just gotten off the radio with Brandon, who was on the other side of the property, when I see some movement over to my right of the pine thicket. I then see a branch move a little bit, and see four deer legs underneath. I readied my bow and my stance, as to make a good clean shot at the deer. Around 15 feet up in a tree, I did this very carefully. About a minute later, as I was looking for any movement, I lost the four legs inside the thicket. This was expected due to the fact that where the deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I waited. Maybe another minute or so later, I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods. The movement I've been waiting for. As I brought the bow up into a full drawn stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was a man. A strange man at that. This absolutely should not have been. If there was a man anywhere near where that deer had been, the deer would have been long gone, spooked back into the thicket. I put my bow back down onto the hook that I screwed into the tree, and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. At only 35 yards away, I could now see in great detail his physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with his belly leading the way. A white, long-sleeved shirt, on with ruffles down the middle, just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you have indulged. It was tucked into thick canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down where his shoes should be, there was absolutely nothing. He had no feet whatsoever, no calves, no shins, no shoes. And with my eyes wide open, I mouthed to myself, what the hell? Instead of walking, he seemed to float through the woods, going from right to left. This is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head. It was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large, red, bulbous nose up in the air, a bit of a snobby overall look. The hair though, it was covered by a wig that judges in England wear. A white wig with three curls on the side of it, where his ears would have been. 
I noticed that he didn't seem to float through the woods. He was floating through the woods. His arms stayed tucked at his sides, unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down. The way his head was cocked, he could have only been looking upwards. This is not any personal animal, as they'd be constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you might trip over. All of this happened within a period of about 20 seconds. He had come out of the thicket behind a medium sized oak tree. Then when he hit the next oak, he never came out from behind it. I watched in absolute astonishment for another five seconds waiting for him to break his cover so that I could see him again. This never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened and was immediately made fun of. I expected that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was just saying I should have taken a picture of the only deer slash human or minotaur remaining in the world. I told him he won't be laughing when the deer tour came over to his tree stand and smacked his ass right out of it. Even though it was in the middle of the hunt, I had to get down and see what the hell just happened. I knew where he would have walked. Not only would I see his footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact the area we were in was full of muddy ground. A freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. As you probably guessed, when I go over to the spot where he had been, there was nothing. I saw not a single track from him, nor deer, nor anything. I was utterly amazed. What happened later that night was just as creepy. So after I was done checking out the muddy snow ground where the man should have left some kind of footprint, I went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that I'd been hunting from earlier. I radioed Brandon and told him I was back up the tree and secure. We always did this as a precaution, in case something happened while we were climbing the tree, or securing the platform of the portable tree stand. My old man's buddy, Bunky, actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless. He was practicing shooting from a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. This has nothing to do with the story, but all of you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know, the more you know. Anyway, we're hunting the rest of the day, but not without periodic raging from Brandon, making fun of me and the deer tool throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or longer. That is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one, which as it turns out, it was not. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we found while scouting in the months prior. So I had him meet me at my spot due to the fact it was going to take me much longer to get my stand down and off the tree. Just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet, jumped down to the ground, and started feverishly explaining to him everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or mud. I definitely could sense he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily, because he looked right at me with his mouth agape, and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forward and said, Are you messing with me, brother? He was also able to tell that I wasn't messing with him. When I looked at him, in what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes he's ever seen and said, Hell no. When he realized I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all the things that I had previously told him and we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had witnessed. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already upon us. 
it was that Stephen King full dark no stars kind of night too, due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy. We were in a patch of woods that we weren't very familiar with. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole new ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was enclosed by a triangle of roads. All we had to do was walk in a straight line, and we could come out somewhere on one of the roads, then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. So we began walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is almost impossible, without a compass, which I didn't have. So we were both figuratively and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. A couple of minutes into the walk, we heard a loud scream, as if someone were being murdered. Now I know what every animal in the wood around here sounds like, both normally or in panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some predator. This was not that at all. After waiting a couple of minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction we thought we should be going. We didn't talk much about what we had just heard, probably because of the anxiety we were both feeling. We couldn't ignore it for long though, because we heard another long blood curdling scream. It was closer this time, and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a woman being attacked. This new scream sounded threatening. Ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point, and we still pushed forwards. After walking another hundred yards or so, we came across something very strange directly in our path. There were these weird, clear gelatinous masses on the top of leaf litter. Now I'm at 32, which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from my experience, but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us. So take it from me, these clear globs should not have been there. The only thing I could think of was that it was tree sap, but it wasn't. I poked one of the masses with a stick, fearing what they were made of. I had read a story about a town that had clear gelatinous globs rain down on them. A lot of these people got very sick, and if I'm not mistaken, I think even a couple of them perished from it. So needless to say, I was taking precautions. Their consistency was that of a thick gelatin, like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. Once we started walking again, we came across a good amount of this stuff. It wasn't all over the woods. Instead, it was directly in front of us as we walked, almost like something or someone knew which route we would try and take and marked it with these globs. Then came another scream, this time even closer and with a little something added in. This time, not too far away from us, we heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap. Something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was unlikely. Whatever it was, wasn't spooked at all. Not from us or the threatening scream. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal when they start running. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This sent our anxiety level through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about floating men, screams or alien jelly. We just wanted out, which should have been very soon. The distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but we hadn't yet. Stranger still, we couldn't see any houses or street lights, but still we kept going thinking we'd find our way out very soon. Our flashlights were now beginning to die, so we were definitely in a hurry. Which, by the way, is not what you should do if you were ever even lost in the woods. 
Cool heads always prevail in this situation. As we were walking, we started to see some pine trees. This was very strange, because we had thoroughly scouted the land. The only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a few more, we got that foreboding feeling, almost like a sick, anxious panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings, and found that the exact spot that we stopped was the same spot we started. We were standing right next to a pine tree, with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off, and dangling still from the severed limb. How could this be? We had been sure we were walking in a straight line. But that must have been an impossibility, since we made a circle. We had no idea whatsoever how this happened, especially since we were in the exact spot we started from. Also very strange, we had seen my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree. It was very close to us, but when we started to walk out it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it, and immediately found the trail that we had to take to leave the woods. It led directly back to my uncle's backyard. The trail actually went right past the live pine tree we had been standing under. There is no way we had missed that from the start. To add more to the strangeness, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail, we see plainly my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Our minds were blown, but at least we were able to get out. On the last hundred yards of the trail, we found more clear gelatin blobs directly down the middle of the pass. This was definitely crazy. They were not there when we walked in. We had both been on the trail when we entered the woods, and we would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves and the twigs break. But we had a strong feeling of being watched when we were still in the woods, and an even stronger version of the same feeling as we stepped onto my uncle's backyard. This is at the top of my list for scariest experiences in the woods. I've no explanation for any part of it. Not the floating ghost guy, not the screams or the globs, not the getting lost in the woods, and not the circle of boulders. I would love to hear from anyone who has had anything like this happen to them. There has to be some kind of answer, but at this point all I have is my story about what happened that night, and thankfully one other person who went with me through it. At least he's been able to validate what happened to people that don't believe this actually happened to us. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but I can assure you this, it happened exactly as you heard it. I know it sounds crazy and outlandish, but it happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. Something incredible had happened back there. I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything bad happen to us. What it did was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. One day I'm going to go back there alone and camp for a night or two in the hopes that something happens again and that I have the strength to seek out whatever it was, and get some answers. This happened to my friend Devon and I, about five years ago. I don't want to release exactly where this occurred, for the sake of anonymity. You see, Devon and I had been close friends since we were kids. I remember me and my mum and my friends all hanging out at the park and taking pictures when we were younger. He was like a second son to my mother. We grew up playing video games, eating junk food, staying up late, climbing out the windows and sneaking off into each other's houses, doing all those goofy things that kids do. We fought, made up, and have a long, long history of friendship. He was my best friend. We had spent all our childhood and teenage years together. We'd gotten relationships and slowly drifted apart as our lives, wives and priorities took hold. 
We were both about 35 when this happened. His wife Emma and my wife Jane were going to go do their own thing with the kids. And it was just a man's weekend going hunting. Me and my bro. It was late in the night. We had already established our camp and were making a plan of where we were going to go next. We were quite familiar with the terrain as we had hunted here before and were very excited for what tomorrow would bring and what we could possibly hunt. The last time we'd come out, you see, our hunt was uneventful and we returned home empty handed. This pushed us further to aim to get something good. As we were discussing our plan, did we notice a strange sound off in the distance? Sort of like a hum, a very low hum, almost magnetic sounding, if that makes sense. We both in unison stop talking and look up into the sky where the sound is coming from. There's nothing but a blanket of stars and our pale firelight illuminating our small camp. We listen attently. The sound is still there and very real. However, we can't sense exactly where it's coming from. We're getting a bit put off. Continue making our plan. And by the time we're finished, it's still there. It's really bothering us. We agree the best course of action would probably be to go to sleep. Perhaps we're just hearing things. It must be some strange animal we've never heard we thought. Animals do make weird sounds. We both go to sleep in our individual tents and pass out. There's something though that bothered me. And a few hours later, the sound had changed. It was more powerful than before. And I swore I could see bright lights flashing over my tent. I thought he was messing with me. So in my sleepy haze, I open the tent and look around. Lights are coming from above and I can see some sort of object floating just above. It is definitely the genesis of this strange noise, now louder than ever. All that I remember is passing out and waking up in the morning, far past the hour of which I should have awoken. My phone alarm didn't even go off. I wasn't sure what was happening then. So I picked myself up off the dirt and looked around. Our campfire had long extinguished. And I looked over to Devon's tent. He wasn't in there. I poked around, shouted his name, but there was no reply anywhere. I was quite scared. Had he started the hunt without me? I looked into his tent one more time and found his gear stashed underneath his sleeping bag, which was empty. I opened it up all the way and that was it. It was completely empty, the bag. He was nowhere to be seen. I tried putting my fear aside, assuming that he'd probably just gone to the toilet. So I shouted his name into the wilderness and received no reply. I found this very daunting and I sat there for what felt like hours and he didn't return. By this point, I was getting absolutely terrified that my friend had died in the wilderness. So I left the camp after sending him a text and started to leave. I did all the necessary proceedings regarding a search and rescue to try and getting found because I was incredibly concerned for my friend. The weird thing was, when I called my wife and told her he was missing, she didn't know who I was talking about. I told her that he was my best friend, and this wasn't a time to mess around, especially with him gone. Note, I omitted everything about the lights and the noise last night. She started getting angry at me, telling her that I was just wasting her time and not to work her up over nothing and that I sounded drunk or high and that I should come home now. I was beyond pissed. What was going on here? 
I look through my phone and find the number of Devon's wife. Give her a call, but she doesn't pick up. I send her a text asking if she'd heard from him. And a few hours later, I receive a reply. Who is this? What the hell was going on? Safe to say they never found his body. They never found anything. When I got home, everyone I spoke to was acting like I was going insane. I learned to drop the subject. I have no idea what's going on. It's like that night, he was erased from reality. Every trace of him, his wife, who apparently we don't speak to and don't even know, his family I'd never met. My mum didn't even know who he was. And the pictures of him and I together as children, I can no longer find, both electronically and physically. He doesn't exist, and I'm the only person that remembers him. Have I gone insane? Some people believe I fell on a rock. That's why I woke up that way and imagined this whole thing. But that can't be real. Can it? Devon, buddy, if you're out there, send me a sign. I think I'm losing my mind. I am from Alaska. I was born into the Togatelli tribe in the center of Alaska in 1980. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks in a small town called Nenana. There are several other tribes in the immediate area and long ago there were far more before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident in case anyone from here ends up hearing this. But suffice to say that paranormal experiences are natural and expected as part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents told my father strange stories of the stick men who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time when Nanana was first being settled by Gusok, white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest, deep into the countryside to the marshes, where moose and bear frequented. Far down the Titana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, afraid to question their violent, wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field, where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try and sneak up, and they rolled out their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd, as they were in a field, but perhaps it was the men rekindling the fire. He peeked out of his tent to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man bundled tightly in his blankets was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks and carried off towards the edge of the camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking of his convoy and screamed, alerting the remaining hunters in the camp who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw but were confused by what to fire at as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run because there was nothing clear to shoot at. But as they ran together, they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited 
until the men were being chased by all the animals, then jumped from his tent, and without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nanana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story and then perished, for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stick men on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. It is said that though the stick men go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearance. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees, or the ground, until you come upon them, or they can visit you as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quick for how awkward it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards, but in some cases it is considered good luck, as if a stick man is uninterested with you, it means that you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man, as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity, and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper, mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stick men, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally at least, I can't be sure. My only experience with one potentially happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup truck late at night, when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. This was no deer. It ran like a dog or cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas a deer would bounce or gallop as they ran. It also moved upwards of 30 miles an hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realized it was much larger than almost any deer I'd ever seen, yet lacked antlers. Please, ask your questions if you have, and feel free to share your own experiences below. When I took the plane to Istanbul, with my classmates in 2012 or 2013. I saw somewhere over the route from Germany to Turkey, a weird black round object in the sky. When I told my female friend who was sitting next to me, we both started freaking out and filmed the entire thing. But you can't see it on our cell phones, since there were too many water droplets on the window, and that black thing was too far away. It was something small and round, and some other round object was flying around the main object, surrounded by black smoke. It was so beautiful, I was sure it was some technology from the government. I regret not screaming inside the plane and making everyone aware of it. Imagine everyone if they'd have seen it, they'd have freaked out, and our plane would have probably gone missing. What if it was top secret? But jokes aside, I'll never forget this incident. When I told my aunt, she told me that I was too stressed and needed to take a break, as I was imagining things. My next two encounters, where I saw something strange, I can't explain either. I was in elementary school, sixth grade. I was outside going to our PE classes with my female friend in tow when I wanted to get inside this building. I saw in front of me, some kind of small white cloud passing by. As weird as it sounds, 
it was flying by really fast. I told my friend, and she also saw it. But we didn't talk about it again until later. I remember I saw this kind of cloud in my young age again. I don't remember where it was, but I remember I saw this cloud twice. I believe that we were living in a dimension where we can't see everything. For example, that cats and dogs can see things we cannot. Perhaps that cloud was from somewhere where we weren't supposed to see it. I tried finding information on Google regarding both incidences, but I have found nothing. There is one final entry. When I was a child, I slept next to my mother. One night, someone came and put my arm up, which hurt me so I screamed. The person ran away, and my mum asked me what happened. She told me I shouldn't be scared, that it was my dad. Until today, I can't believe this. When asking my parents, they tell me it was my dad who came and tried to change my bad sleeping position. I can't believe this, because why would he run away when I started to scream and cry? He's not like that. Not to mention the person or thing I saw looked scary. It was dark, and he was pitch black looking, and I could only see his eyes. All I could see was a silhouette. Believe me or not, since then I've had bad dreams of this person every night, when I fall asleep on my left side. I remember my mum told me once, when we were sleeping on our left side, that we have bad dreams. Maybe she was joking, but it left a big impact on me. Every night, I tried to make sure I didn't sleep on my left side, so that I wouldn't see that person again. I saw him several years later. It was a real trauma for me, and I really don't think it was my dad. Finally, there's one more. I was with my family in the living room. All my cousins were there. They'd come from the Netherlands to visit. In the evening, we were telling each other creepy stories. After that, we went into the living room, watched some TV and talked. Suddenly, I saw the other room, where lights were still turned on. I could see on the wall the shadow of a water bottle, but there was something round and huge flying around it. Actually, I kept staring at it and wondering what it could be. Then it stopped. It was very strange. I wish I knew what it was. To this day, I keep wondering what happened to come across my sister. It was winter time here in the suburbs of North Virginia. I live with my family in a neighborhood not too far from Washington DC. So that's not to say we're in the middle of nowhere. Although our home is very close to a few decently large wooded parks. One night, I was at my then girlfriend's place up near the city. I got a phone call from my sister around seven, which in winter makes it pretty much nighttime here. I didn't think anything of it. Usually she calls me for random things she needs my insight on. I bet I'm up my sister. Ever since she was little, she loved horror movies. Growing up with her, I can tell you firsthand that she isn't easily scared and loves the paranormal. All right, back to the call. I picked up the phone and first thing I realized was her voice was breaking up. She was sobbing and could barely talk clearly. Instantly, my mind started rushing with horrible thoughts about what could have happened. She kept trying to tell me to come home as soon as possible. I asked her why and if everything's okay, and she wouldn't say. She just kept asking me to come home. Obviously, I got in my car and rushed home. The neighborhood is very dim. There aren't many lights on, only the few solar panel garden lamps from surrounding homes. And as soon as I got home, I ran inside and asked her again what happened. And she finally began explaining. About half an hour before she called me, she went outside to grab a few things from her car again. It was dark out, but when the car is unlocked, the headlights turn on. When she opened the door to the car, the light was shining from the driveway onto the roof of the garage, and she noticed it, 
from the inside of the car. A short, bipedal human-looking thing standing on two jet-black muscular legs. At first, she thought it was a raccoon, but this would have been obvious to her. But this thing, it scared her to the point of crying. While she was in the car, her view was obstructed from the rest of the creature, which was crouching, and from what she described, was scratching at something on the roof, trying to get in. Maybe. But she wasn't going to just stick around to find out. She got out of the car, pretending to not have spotted it. This thing, it acted in a seemingly intelligent way. She thought maybe, if I act like I didn't see it, it would just stay up there and not try to attack me or anything. But as she walked behind the car, she heard it stand upright. Startled, she looked directly up at it. She gave me the following description. It was jet black, smooth, dolphin-like skin, with arms and legs, five-digit hands and no claws, dead-looking, very dirty, and hair covering its head and body. The face is what was disturbing. The face had two shining yellow eyes that glowed from the car's headlights, no nose, just two slits, and a very wide mouth with no lips. She took off when she made eye contact, and as soon as she was indoors, she called 911, and an officer was dispatched to our house. He looked around back to try and see if there was any damage or any sign of someone climbing on the roof, but there were no footprints nor damage. It was all in place. The officer just told us to lock the doors and windows, and left. It's not like my sister to be terrified to the point of calling the police. Whatever this thing was though, I can only imagine what it was actually like to witness something like this in real life. To this day, both me and her get extremely uneasy, arriving home after dark, thinking that something might be waiting there for us. This is a story relayed to me by my father. Many years ago, he was doing a road trip of the States. He was driving along one night, determined to stay up. He'd been driving for about five hours, and it was approaching midnight. Exhaustion and fatigue from the day had been getting to him, and he was starting to feel the strain at the wheel. Every moment, was another fight against sleep, and he kept his eyes open, determined to stay awake, for his destination lied only a half hour away. He thought it best to pull over for a brief respite. So he pulled over on the side of the road. It was a fairly desolate place, and there were no other cars. He stopped, looked about, and it was pitch black. The moon was high in the sky, but other than that, it gave very little light for this surrounding area. He got out of his car, reached a hint to his pocket, and fumbled, retrieving a cigarette box, pulled out a cigarette and lit it, while sighing deeply. He really needed to make it that next half hour. As he stood there, thinking about what he was going to do tomorrow, and dreaming about the comfort of a bed for the night, did he hear something in the distance? He turned his head, and didn't see anything, and just ignored it, assuming it was the sound of the wind. He finished his cigarette. He stood on the ember, and just as he was about to open the car door, did he look around again, that's when he saw it. The moonlight was reflecting, and there was something in the trees, something vaguely humanoid shape. He tried squinting. Was it a person that needed help? Why were they not approaching? But moreover, why were they standing there creepily, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night? When he realized just how odd this was, did my dad quicken his pace, threw open the car door and closed it, feeling safety within his vehicle. He didn't even do his seatbelt up. He tore us out of there quickly and started making his way 
to his destination to get some sleep. He looked in his rearview mirror after a few seconds and didn't see anything, and a surge of relief washed over him. As he carried on with his drive, did he occasionally glance in the mirror, and after a few minutes, he noticed it. It was following him. It was matching his speed. He was going at nearly 60 miles an hour. How could this creature be keeping up with him? My father thought he was going mad, but dared not stop to pinch himself and verify this. He put his foot on the accelerator and pumped that machine harder. 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. His car was now really suffering, yet this creature seemed not to stop. Its speed matched the whole time, and as my father was putting his foot further and further, to the point where it wouldn't speed up anymore, he swore he thought the creature was gaining on him. My father was absolutely bricking it. Fear, panic, and terror all consuming him within his mind. His glances back to the mirror were now frequent. His fear was overcoming him, his heart was racing, and he didn't know what to do. And just as quickly as it had started following him, did the creature vanish. It must have run off into a bush or something, or realised my father wasn't worth pursuing. He didn't stop. The speed he maintained he carried on for several hours. He decided to forget about his little hotel for the night and kept on driving until he reached his friend's place. He passed out when he reached his house, about 8am the next day. The fear fueled him all night, and he told me that he would never visit that part of the States again, and warned me that if I were to find myself down a lonely road in the middle of the night, to keep going, and to be wary of my surroundings. Who knows if that creature, whatever it might be, is still out there. How it could reach those speeds, he doesn't know, and he doesn't want to find out. He's just grateful that he got out with his life. I live in Russia, and my encounter happened around a year ago in February. I was walking by the embankment at 10pm. It was already dark, and nobody was around. There is a road which has three levels, a big street. Then it goes down into a smaller one, and finally the embankment, which turns into a small path through thick snow. Just imagine, you're walking through an industrial area which barely has street lights, no people, and on your left, there is a little forest. And on the right, there is a river. So I was walking on the path when I saw this man. His whole appearance alarmed me instantly. He had skis on, but was trying to walk as he was without them. In the deep snow, it was around his knee level, and I saw how much effort it took for him not to fall and carry on moving. There was no way to avoid this person, because it was a tiny path through the snow. He was staring at me, smiling. I'm unsure if it was in a predatory way, but something was strange in the smile. I thought, well, if anything happens, I can push him and run, and carry on moving. When I was right next to him, this happened. Everything took place in about three seconds. I was watching his every move with my side vision, and in one moment, he vanished. There was nowhere to hide. The trees give you at least a hundred meters worth of visibility, and hiding in the snow isn't an option. You would be visible regardless. He was gone. I slightly turned my head to that direction when I captured something right behind me. A stick man. It was absolutely black, around my height, maybe a bit taller, very thin, with a big head and no neck at all. 
it was standing in a very threatening position, with its arms set apart like an animal preparing to attack. This figure looked like a picture printed straight onto the air. I thought the 2D object should be material at some point, with the thickness of a sheet of paper for example. But no, this looked entirely different. I turned my head away and started running to the second level of the road. When I got there, I looked back. This thing was peeking out of a tree, and when I spotted it, it hid behind it. At this point I really thought that I was going to die for sure, and when I got to the third level some cars were driving by, so it calmed me down a little. I looked back. The stick man was standing in the spot where I was a second ago, right in the middle of the road. The whole landscape looked so unreal that at some point I questioned my sanity. This time, I kept the contact and tried to examine the thing. The stick man was slightly moving back and forth, but its whole body had a very stable dark black figure. I got a feeling the feeling saying that I shouldn't be seeing this, that my survival instincts were blurring out of my mind, that were telling me to flee. And it was also a feeling like, he's found me. Imagine the feeling when you play hide and seek, and your cousin is very slow finding anyone, so you sit somewhere for 20 minutes. At first you feel the pleasure from the game, but then as time drags on you get bored. And when they finally find you, it's almost like a relief. I think that's something tried to stop me from walking away, because at some point there was a little desire to approach it. Anyway, it was obvious that it was following me, and the thing is I lived very close to that area. I didn't know what to do, either to wander through the streets so it would lose me, or go directly home. But this thing would know where I lived. I decided to run to safety immediately without looking back. And yes, that wasn't the end. That night, I had sleep paralysis. I remember laying in bed listening to the sound of water from my aquarium, when it suddenly stopped. I thought someone was trying to grab my attention, so I opened my eyes, and right next to the bed was the same black figure. This was it. The end of my life. I literally saw my entire existence flash before my eyes. It stood three feet away from me, and then it turned in a fog, and started to fill my lungs through my nose and throat. When it was entirely inside my body, I awoke, or I didn't sleep at all, I don't know. The thing is, I haven't noticed any difference with myself since. This whole encounter was very different from anything I've seen in my life. There are things you've never experienced before, so you don't actually know what to think or feel, and are filled with curiosity. I am low-key disturbed. Would I one day find myself in the middle of nowhere approaching a random person with the skis on, and disappearing next moment? Did that dream mean anything, or was it a dream? I barely remember that man's face. This has been a terribly odd and confusing experience, and if anyone has encountered anything similar, I'd love to hear about it, so that I know I'm not the only one. I must preface this with a few things. This encounter is second hand, but was told to me on multiple occasions by the person that experienced it. I am a natural skeptic, and cynic, so I can't say that I 100% believe it, but his telling of it was pretty simple yet concise, and did not vary between the retellings. I've known this guy for many years, and his advice and input on just about everything is well reasoned and always helpful, so I'll just try to take his word on it even if with a grain of salt. So let's get down to business. My friend Marv likes to go solitary camping on occasion, to be at one with nature. 
He is also an avid gun collector and enthusiast. I don't remember exactly when he said that this took place. But it was a few years back. And he decided to go camping on a whim. He packed his gear, a few guns, a hunting rifle, and a 0.45 sidearm specifically, and headed out into the country onto a vast swatch of property owned by a friend of his. He had full permission in the works. This happened close to the Kisachi National Forest in South slash Central Louisiana. He liked to hike in pretty deep and camp at specific spots that he found a few trips prior. These details are kind of sparse, as it's not really the meat and potatoes to this encounter. So he made his way in and set up camp in his usual small clearing for the night. Skipping ahead a few hours, it was now late afternoon, when he heard leaves crunching and twigs being stepped on. He assumed it was an animal at first, and got up from cooking something on the fire to try and get a look. He gazed in the direction of the noise, and saw a man approaching through the trees a good many yards away. He has described his etiquette for dealing with other people in very remote places as always being cautious, as more often than not, the people he comes across are armed like him. He tries to stay friendly, but he still keeps his guard up, looking for any ulterior motives, as you can never tell what some folks are up to in the middle of nowhere. He'll make chit chat with them, find out generally what they're up to if he can, and occasionally share a meal. He's never really met anyone nefarious as of yet, other than this situation, and maybe one other, but that's a different ordeal. So one thing that sets off small alarm bells for him is that he knows he's the only one with permission to be on this property. And secondly, this guy is not dressed for the location. He says the guy was wearing a white t-shirt, blue jogging shorts and white socks and sneakers. Mind you, Marv is miles out in the middle of the woods, away from any paths, roadways, houses or anything really. Nobody is going to casually stroll into his current location dressed like that, unless they are lost or confused. It was early fall, but not quite cool, very normal for Louisiana. So there's a ton of mosquitoes, ticks and other insects aplenty. You're not going to have most of your skin exposed if you can help it deep in the woods. I know that all too well from personal experience myself. So Marv assumes something might be up and calls out, Hey, do you need help with something? He says it quite loudly, definitely loud enough to be heard. The guy, however, keeps walking, staring directly at him. Marv is starting to get unnerved. And as I said, I know this guy well, and he is as cool as a cucumber in a tense situation. Getting more uneasy as the guy is closing the distance. He gets to his feet and loudly declares, Hey man, can I help you with something or what? The guy is now 10 to 15 feet away, standing at the edge of the clearing in the forest. The guy looking at Marv dead in the eye speaks and clearly says, help me. Marv said he was already starting to actually get worried at this point because he said the way the guy said this was as if something that didn't exactly know how to talk was saying help me, or at least that's how he first thought of it. It just didn't sound right. The guy still unmoving says, help me again, but this time more emphatic and just really loud. Marv said, this is when he was picking up on what was truly wrong about this. He said the timbre of his voice was more female and actually sounded like a recording being played back and that the guy's lips and mouth movements weren't matching up with the phrase. 
It was like he was just opening his mouth, emitting the phrase and closing it again. Marv asked, What do you need help with? Not daring to back up or move whatsoever. The guy still standing motionless was staring directly at him and said, Help me, again and repeated the phrase another three times slowly, but not louder in volume. Marv, now totally unsure of what the hell is going on, interrupts the guy by barking. All right, you need to go now unless you actually need my help. Do you need my help or not? He continues loudly and firmly in tone. The guy didn't miss a beat and started up with the help me's again and made it as if to take another step in Marv's direction. Marv told me, that's when he did the only thing that made sense in the moment, and drew his .45 semi-auto pistol, and pointed it at the guy telling him that he needed to go. The guy started to get more animated and agitated, actually starting to say the phrase louder, over and over, but not stepping closer or backing away. Marv did what he thought was right given his current predicament, assuming he was dealing with an unstable or potentially dangerous individual and discharged a round into the ground in front of the guy. Now this is where it gets crazy. I'm not kidding. As the guy stops uttering the phrase, he goes silent and is still staring at Marv full on. He backflips and somersaults into the woods and immediately out of sight. Yes, you heard that right, just like a gymnast. Now I know what you're thinking, because I had the same reaction. This sounds completely made up for sure. But Marv gave me no indication of falsehood, and told me this on multiple times each time, in a dead serious demeanour. Yet, Marv said the guy backflipped away effortlessly, as if pulled by an unseen tension coil. He described it as completely humanly unnatural, and totally out of place. The guy had just appeared and repeated the same phrase over and over, eventually almost becoming frantic, before Marv shot at the ground, causing him to flee, in the most peculiar manner. Marv said he stood there focused on the forest, where the guy just flipped into, and saw and heard no further movement. It was like the guy had never been there. He stayed like this as the sun began to set, and the normal night noises crept in. As I mentioned before, Marv is a pretty unshakable fellow, and actually stayed in the area for the night, and next night, before returning with no further incident. When he has told me, and some other friends about this, of course we ask many questions. We prod him to elaborate on the guy's speech sounds. He said the more he thought about it after the incident, the more he was sure it was definitely a female's voice coming from the guy. It was almost like he slash it had heard someone say it, and mimicked it like a parrot, or any other talking bird would. Almost like a lure. He doesn't know what it wanted and didn't give any indication to follow or utter anything else. It reacted immediately to the gunshot, and you know what follows there. He's been back to the property since, with no other strange occurrences. The only other minute detail that I can think of, is that he did remember hearing during the early morning of the first night, what sounded like a gunshot off in the distance and it did sound eerily similar to his .45. He thought he may have heard it again on the hike back. There are people that hunt in the area, and of course it could have just been that, so he couldn't be sure. Since this incident, and one other he had in a completely different location, he did some online research of the whole Kisachi area, and found many legends, stories, and supposed encounters dealing with skimwalkers, and other unnerving bits of Native American folklore in the area. Not to mention, mimics, and other similar supposed creatures. A lot of his encounters line up with these tales, 
but there's nothing tangible to prove it. But even as a skeptic, it does make me wonder about strange things in the remote and untouched areas of the world that can't be explained. I am 23 now, and the time that this occurred was my first summer out of high school. And me and my three friends, fresh off their freshman year of college, decided to live together. One of my friends, my best friend for years, Earl, had a long-time girlfriend whose father owned the property. It was a decently sized plot of land with several old cabins on it, their house, which was large and out in the back of the woods, and a few other scattered buildings. I think it used to be a campground before he bought it to live on it and run his business out of it. We live in southern Maine, and the property is heavily wooded. Pine Tree State for the win. The house that we lived in was at the very front of the property right on the road. The owner's house was at the very rear and could only be accessed by a dirt road with two ditches on the side. A one minute walk towards the woods from our front house was a small little cabin across a clearing and it was furnished and powered. In the house was me, Earl, John and Chuck. We all had some different girls and girlfriend pals and partied through the summer. We would frequently come here to the cabin and the owner's house before moving in. Anyway, enough with the scene setting. Some of this story is from word of mouth from the others living in the home, but we have all been friends a long time, and I trust them implicitly and I witnessed enough myself to know that this all lined up. So, the first encounter was at the very beginning of summer, before we even moved in. It was evening and dark, and everyone was at the owner's house watching a movie. As I slowly drive my car down the dirt path to the owner's, something white and large in size ran in front of my car. It was a blur. It was too fast to really catch what it was. But being in the woods, I assumed it was some kind of albino fox. I shrugged it off and made my way to the house. A week later, we were all situated and moved into the front home by the street and things were great. I'll admit the front area of the property was spooky, despite being the most open and least wooded. The owner's mother had lived in our house and died years ago. We could see an old statue of Mother Mary off in the woods that was always kind of sketchy. Across the street was a small independent tire shop with a small dirt lot. Only thing in the house when we moved in was some kind of antique cheetah statue, which appeared to be from the 60s, tall and skinny in a sitting position and went up to mid waist. So we put it in the corner of the hallway, thought it was neat and retro. For a few weeks, all was normal. Admittedly, some friends experimented with some different substances like LSD and salvia once or twice, paired with the normals like drinking. I do not believe this impacted what happened though. We have some parties, invite girls over for some fun, jam out on the guitars in the cabin. It was a great time, but things slowly became tense and went downhill. A lot happens, and I believe that they are all connected, even though they seem disjointed and random. After a few weeks of fun, Earl had developed crippling insomnia due to some tooth pain that unfortunately he could not afford to fix. He would clock maybe one hour of sleep per night and slowly became more and more irritable but nothing too serious. One night, John and Earl and some of their friends, who we will call Don, are out back in the cabin. They had done some slight drinking, but John was a straight edge who never touches anything of any kind. Earl is playing on his guitar and singing some of our original tunes. This portion of the story, until I came into play, is recanted by John. During the night, our fourth roommate Chuck is asleep in bed, while I'm in my room, 
Azel plays his guitar and he says to Don, Wow man, those are some great harmonies you're doing. Since when can you sing? Don looks a little confused and tells Earl that he wasn't singing along. Earl starts singing again, but stops when he hears the harmonies a second time. He thought his ears were tricking him, but John and Don had heard them too. They put the guitar down and decide to investigate. They walked through the clearing briefly, startled by Mother Mary in the woods, until they reached the front of the road. From across the street, they see the biggest white cat they'd ever seen. Not just a cat, but the size of a larger dog or mountain lion. They scramble to try and get a video with their phones, at which point I see them out the window and run down to meet them. As I hit the yard, I'm just stunned as they are, and see this giant white bobcat sitting on a hill across the tire shop. It's massive, about the size of a German shepherd. But something was wrong. Its tail. It had a gross, nasty, fleshy tail, as if it had the tail of a rat. It's long, so I can't see all of it. But it's definitely proportionally wrong, and way longer than a normal cat. Let alone, fleshy and bald. Don picks up a rock and throws it at it. I kid you not, all four of us, too fully sober, watching this thing stand up on its hind legs and calmly walk into the woods, dragging its tail behind us, and we book it inside. Earl is more sleepless than normal, trying to drink himself to sleep. He is successful and Don does the same. I don't remember how John and I fell asleep that night. Every creak of the house petrified me. The next morning we wake Chuck up, and thoroughly scare him. We're all kind of on edge for the rest of the day. But with the sun out, the fun starts back up, and we put it to the back of our minds. Today, Earl confides in me about his lack of sleep, and how he does not expect this experience to help. Night comes again, and everyone decides to have a low-key evening after all the excitement from the evening prior. That evening, Chuck suffers from his first and only night terror of his life. He's awake in his bed, and he's in some kind of paralysis, and he hears the growls, slash snarls, slash screams of a cougar-type creature or bobcat as a giant white mass runs across the doorway of his room. He slowly regains movement and comes into my room to tell me what happened. He doesn't sleep for the rest of the night, and the next morning, we bring the cheetah statue into the cabin from across the clearing. For another few weeks, nothing tremendous happens. We continue to be on edge, and Earl slips a little further, but things are slowly getting better. I do a little research about what we've seen. Cryptozoology, demons and monsters. Finally, I make a breakthrough. I find an article, nothing big, from an old book about main urban legends. The book was from a while ago, and described something called the Ding Bull Cougar, or Plunkus. It just sounds better as Plunkus. Anyway, I said Ding Bull was a cougar, whose last tail joint was bull shaped and bare of hair and flesh. Ding Bull was fond of human flesh and would sing with a human voice to lure the incautious out of their cabins at night, where it waited in the dark to crack their skulls with its tail. My heart stopped as I read this, because it matched so well with our experience. Mind you, it said nothing of walking on its hind legs or being white, but the similarities still shocked me, and I kept this info on my chest for a while. A few days later, Earl's insomnia came to a head. It would be about 10pm, and I laid in bed before I heard a massive crash. From the audible vantage point I was at, it sounded like someone had fallen down the stairs. I rushed into the hallway as Earl came from his room, and I yelled, What the hell was that? Earl turned to me, and raised his fist and said, Shut up, man. 
and ran down the stairs. I sat in my room for a minute confused, and after about 20 minutes I went to my car and drove to my parents to spend the night. I stayed the rest of the day with my parents too. That night, Earl called me to apologize. The crashing had come from his room, where he had angrily kicked a chair due to oral pain. And when I came out, he thought I was angrily yelling. What the hell was that? To him. We made up on the phone, and then he asked me something peculiar. Hey man, did you come home today at all? No? Why? He explained that he was the last one out, so he had to lock the doors. As we had been for about two weeks since we all started freaking out. Earl had the only key. Okay. And? I asked. He sounded a little scared when he said this. The cheetah statue was on top of Chuck's bed. I told him not to touch it. Even later that night, when I got back to the house, Chuck's room was closed, and we went and took a look. The cheetah had been placed in the centre of Chuck's bed, standing up. He had a lumpy mattress, and the fact that it had stood so straight was impressive and unnatural. It was not leaning, tilted, or anything. As soon as I touched it, it fell over, and the next day I took it and hid it somewhere no one else could bother to look for it. In one of the older cabins, where they only use for storage. The thing is, the next night, it was back in Chuck's room. The bed was made up neatly, and the cheetah was placed under the blankets with its head out, as if it were taking a nap. We burned the statue the next day. I wish I could say that solved everything, but it didn't. Over the next few weeks, we continued to be stalked by white blurs in the corner of our vision, the rustling of leaves, and the occasional faint whisper of singing in the distance. At one point, the Mother Mary statue was even turned backwards, no longer facing the home. I'm not sure when, but we only noticed at this point. A few days passed and summer was up, and we all left. We still visit different spots of the property, but avoid that house. We hear the occasional rustle, but we don't watch for colour anymore, because we don't want to see the white blur. After all this, I don't know what the Plunkus is. A beast? A spirit? A demon? All of them? All I know is that Earl never got his tooth fixed. The pain just went away. Chuck has never had a night terror since, and I know that it's still there, and I remember how old and mysterious my state still is. Hell, Stephen King loves it for a reason, right? I had pet rabbits as a kid. They lived outside in a cage, a really big cage inside a bigger shed, which was pretty nice for rabbits, and it had heating and everything. I got home late from something, maybe a family party. I went out with my older sister to feed them, and at the time we were about five and seven. On the way to the cage, we both saw what appeared to be a really tall, thin man running inhumanly fast through our backyard. We live in what is basically a swamp, and he had to have cleared this giant down tree and run through mud and ferns. But regardless, he seemed to be going over 15, maybe even 20 miles per hour. We both dropped what we had and bolted back inside. At the time, our parents were able to convince us it was a deer or something. We wanted to believe it, so we convinced ourselves that it was. I convinced myself for over a decade of what we saw. But fast forward to a few years ago, I was at a park near my house with a friend late at night. I pulled into the dirt road drive in my outback and parked facing the old practice field. It was far too foggy to see across the field, except for a split second, where we could see what appeared to be a very tall man running across the field. We drove as fast as that Subaru could take us, drifting out of the park. Now, a year or two ago, I was at the same park, under similar circumstances. This time it was clear, but very windy. From across the field and into the field, 
we heard a crash and a scream. Not a crash, then a scream, they were simultaneous. It was the most shrill, terrifying, god-awful screech I'd ever heard. More human than a fisher cat, but far louder and more shrill than even a woman. We noped out of there as fast as we could. There was also one other thing that happened. Anyway, this was when I was a sophomore in high school, around the same time of the first encounter at the practice field from the previous story. I was at my friend Nick's house, with a couple of other friends, and we were all staying the night. It was just the four of us high schoolers there at night. That same night, there was a severe weather warning due to a storm that had the potential to create tornadoes, which it did closer to the Connecticut River Valley, and parts of Massachusetts. I think there were somewhere around three small tornadoes that night, pretty wild for New England slash New York. The wind even without the tornadoes was intense, and we were just glad that this house had a good sized yard with no tall trees to fall. It was pouring rain, there was lightning, and the classic backdrop to your spooky story. We're all set up on the second story of the top floor. One of our friends was asleep and somehow managed to sleep through this entire ordeal. The rest of us were all awake, talking about how we weren't in danger of tornadoes, except one of us was convinced that we were all going to die that night. Mid-conversation, there's a loud bang, and the entire house rattles. Is that even supposed to happen? What could it be? We come up with some theories. Is there a tree down? No trees? Earthquake? No reports online? Maybe wind? No trees downed outside? We're down to the bulkhead, just slammed the door shut. And we grab a few knives and head downstairs. In the living room, we all notice for the first time how many porcelain dolls Nick's mother owns. We check every room to find nothing but those creepy dolls, but nothing that could cause a bang. There are two rooms left, the basement and the closet, that is barely enough to hold folded linens. We decide if the bulkhead isn't locked, then we forgot to close it, and there'll be water in the basement and the sound we heard was the wind knocking it shut. If the bulkhead is locked, we remembered to close it. The bulkhead was locked shut, and the floor was bone dry. The sound wasn't the bulkhead. There's one room left, and it's the closet. What could be in the closet? It's only big enough to hold Houdini himself. We open it up, and instantly something falls and we hear the sound of glass shatter. Looking at the ground, it's one of the dolls. What was it doing in the closet? Why would it be propped up that easily to let it fall? We couldn't care. We just went upstairs and did our best to fall asleep. It's something that we all try not to think about, but every once in a while we hear a murmur or a grunt, and we'll never know what it was or where it was coming from. We also don't know whatever happened, to that broken doll. I am 16. This happened the 8th of July, 2016. I live in Massachusetts, which is where this happened. The day started normally. I went to school, had a test in vet tech, as I go to a technical high school, and one of its classes is vet tech, and I took the bus home. Both of my parents were at work like normal, but after three hours when my mum should have been home, I got worried. About 5pm I got a call from my dad, who told me my mum was in a car accident, and that they are both in the hospital, and would be there for a while. It got very late, almost 10, and my parents weren't home, so I decided to put my younger brothers to bed. I stayed up, waiting for my parents to get home and I spent my time reading and writing an essay for school until around 1am. I got a call from my dad who said he wasn't coming home. He was staying in a motel that was closer to the hospital. I got off the phone and finished the part of the essay I was on. I gathered my stuff and walked through the kitchen, heading towards the stairs that led upstairs, 
when a moaning sound reached my ears. The moaning came from outside. It was really loud, and stopped occasionally, like whatever was making the sound voice was cracking. It sounded pained. I turned on the outside light to see an ugly sight. Sitting in the yard just a few feet from the house was a coyote. It was horribly injured. His head was partially caved in on the left side, its paw was bleeding, and this was evident by the pool of blood with the paw in the direct middle. It appeared that it had a long deep gash all the way down its back, and all of the wounds were bleeding. I reached for my pocket, trying to get my phone, only to realise I had left it on the table I'd been working on. I turned and rushed back to the table. I was planning to call a local vet clinic that I knew was open 24-7. When I reached the table, the moaning got much, much louder and more pained. Then it stopped. I grabbed my phone and ran back to the window. At first, I was confused. The coyote was gone, replaced by a common tabby cat. It was odd. The cat was sitting directly in the same place the coyote had been. After the initial shock, I noticed that the tabby cat had the same injuries. Same bleeding paw, same caved in head, and the same gnashes down its back. Something was different, however. I couldn't pinpoint the difference for a good three minutes. Then I realised that the right shoulder blade was kind of pointing out at a completely unnatural angle. It looked deformed and painful and I dropped my phone as soon as I noticed this. When my phone hit the floor, the cat began meowing loudly. I stared at it as it meowed and stared right back at me. It was looking directly at me, and blinking. After a good while, I slowly picked up my phone off the floor. I straightened back up and looked out the window, and the cat was gone. I had only looked away for a few seconds, and in that short time, the horribly injured cat had vanished. Some unknown feeling made me go outside to look for the cat. I don't know what it was. Worry? Perhaps curiosity. Hell, it might have been something the animal made me feel. I have no clue. Now outside, I first walked to the puddle of blood and looked for a trail of it. I found it and started to follow the trail and found that it ended as soon as it passed the gate. To make sure that I could see it in the dark, I pulled up my phone and illuminated the ground around me. I looked around for five minutes, but didn't see anything. Just like the cat, the trail had also vanished. I called the veterinary clinic, and they sent out a car, and they looked around, but the trail was gone, and they couldn't find it. At the time, I didn't think of this until afterwards but I realised that there was no trail of blood leading to my house. I have no idea what the hell this thing was. None of my searches have turned up any results close to what I saw. I am completely convinced that the coyote and the cat were the same creature, and that it is neither a coyote nor a cat. Afterwards, I asked around, and there were no records of dead cats or coyotes turning up with injuries. The creature couldn't get far with those wounds that it had. Does anyone have any ideas of what I saw? In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five minutes to tow down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cosy. The woods up there were weird too. I've never really been in the main house, after all. But the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep from all the noise, the floorboards creaking, the thumps and knocks. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. 
Half an hour there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but it was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered about. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you might imagine a fairy make. It would come from a different location each time I sought it. Then I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks, or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise. Just like things running all around you and dashing about the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and from by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, deer run away and crush about doing it. These steps were like something or things running swiftly around me. It's like it would cross the trail ahead and then behind me, and then alongside me, but I would never see it. I was a big time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork into 3 or 4 am. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks, and see if I could locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get me, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 am. I can still see it on the top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out, noted the clouds were dispersed a bit more, and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette, and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods, when something caught my eye. It looked like a silhouette of someone leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see someone with a palm planted against the wall, with one arm straight out leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or if the lighting is funny or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped onto the fresh snow, there it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on the tree put the thing at seven feet tall. It ran along the border of the fence, and back off into the woods. It was hairless as far as I could tell, and completely naked. Otherwise though, its form was just that of a skinny tall man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up a set of what had to be at least a size 14 or 15 bare foot. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard as if heading into the woods, but then the tracks ended about 20 inches short of the wood line. I don't know if they managed to jump to the tree line, probably because there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It's like it just completely vanished after that. Wyoming is one of the largest states in America covering nearly 98,000 square miles. Despite its size, Wyoming has less than 600,000 residents, making it one of the least populated states in the US. Its history is rich, and is as dark as the coal that fills the endless stream of boxcars winding their way across the western plains. Many battles, and a great deal of blood has been shed, by both the white man and the Native Americans in the fight over the lands and its resources. So as you can well imagine, 
many residents believe the land is cursed. There are countless stories of paranormal activity, from ghost encounters, Bigfoot sightings, to skimwalkers and cryptids alike. Not to mention stories of UFOs and alien abductions. This story, however, is not about spirits, or anything of that nature. As a kid, my family would often go camping at Lake Desmet, just outside of Buffalo. These camping trips often included taking the boat out for some water skiing and or fishing. On one particular trip, my father and I were fishing in the middle of the lake. The water was so calm and still, it almost resembled glass. The glare from the midsummer sun's reflection off the water was nearly blinding. Still, we talked lazily about everything and nothing. I recall my father commenting on the fact he thought it was rather strange the fish were not biting at all. He stated it as if something had scared them away. I didn't give what he said much thought, as I was preoccupied by the sudden ripples that began to dance across the water, giving the lake's surface a funhouse mirror effect. I recall thinking it was rather odd for this to be occurring, considering there was no boat or anyone in sight for that matter. My heart began to pound in my chest, as the ripples soon turned to waves that slapped against the side of the boat with enough force to cause it to rock back and forth. Judging from the look on my father's face, I could tell he too was feeling uneasy about the current situation. Dad, are you seeing this? I asked, trying to keep the fear from creeping into my voice. I am, is all he could say, his eyes nervously scanning the lake. I should point out that the lake is said to have a depth of 70 feet on average, and 130 feet at its deepest. Others say no one knows how deep it truly is. There are countless stories regarding a creature known as Smetty. Descriptions of the cryptid are as varied as the sightings. Some describe it as a giant eel with a horse-like head, while others say it resembles an enormous alligator. Most witnesses describe the monster as a classic Loch Ness monster style creature. Now keep in mind, I had heard all of the stories and truly believed they were just tall tales. However, all the doubt I had was blown out of the water as I watched what looked like the head and neck of a massive sea monster rise out of the depths, about 50 yards from the boat. As we watched in silence, the creature lazily drifted across the water as if it didn't have a care in the world. Needless to say, my father and I were peeing ourselves with excitement and fear. It was my father that first broke the silence. Well, I'll be damned. It does exist. Yeah. Neither of us had thought to bring a camera, so there was no way to capture a picture of the encounter. To be honest, even if we would have, we were both so shaken I doubt either of us would have gotten a decent picture at all. We just sat there staring in awe and disbelief for what seemed like hours. In truth, the whole encounter lasted maybe all of two minutes, before the lake creature disappeared beneath the lake's surface. My father and I looked at one another without speaking and quickly began reeling in our lines. Well, I guess I know why the fish weren't biting, I pointed out. Indeed, my father replied, with a slight shiver. I think it's time for us to get the hell out of this lake, he suggested. I nodded my head in agreeance, and without another word to my father, cranked the boat's motor, and we hauled ass back to shore, cautiously keeping an eye out for the monster. I've been back to Lake Desmet many times since, and have yet to see the creature again. However, sightings and stories continue to circulate. Although there is no actual proof that Smetty exists, I know without a doubt that it indeed does. If any of you have seen it or heard about this elusive creature, 
I would love to hear from you down below. This happened 10 years ago. My parents agreed not to tell me about it because they knew it would terrify me. I only found out recently because my older brother let it slip. To preface this story, both of my parents are extremely rational people, both scientists and skeptics, but they don't like to talk about this because they can't explain it. They won't admit it, but I can tell it scared them, and they would change the subject whenever I bring it up. I've gone to great lengths to try and find a reasonable explanation for the following, but all I have are scraps. My mother has admitted to me, despite her non-believing nature, that if there's anyone who could have had contact with the supernatural or extraterrestrials, it would be me. She tells me that sometimes as a baby, I'd look at her and she'd get chills down her spine, like there was something I knew. From a very young age, I had an innate and irrational fear of the classic alien image. My dad, being a bit of a prankster, used to get a kick out of hiding a little glow-in-the-dark plushy green alien on my shelf, because he knew that I would start screaming in terror from my crib the moment I saw it. Recently, I was going through old home videos and found footage of me, three years old, sitting at the foot of my little bed, wordlessly staring at the toy across the room. Before I could get up and pace back and forth to the window to peek out the blinds up at the sky and pace back, in the video, my dad asked me why I wasn't scared. I told him it was because it wasn't dark outside. My family used to spend summers at our cottage home in the middle of nowhere, Nova Scotia. By middle of nowhere, I really mean it. Our road is unpaved, and the land itself used to be a cattle farm run by my great-great-grandfather before it was sold and overgrown. We have very minimal internet connection as it's a recent development too, that we have to get via radio tower from the next town over. There have been nights when my dad and I have been outside stargazing, as he fancies himself an amateur astronomer, and we've seen satellite-like objects moving low in the sky in a zigzag, unpredictably and impossibly smooth in motion, before it disappeared. There's no flashing to indicate a passenger aircraft or helicopter, and it's always far too fast. My dad's reaction is usually just, oh, that's weird, and we forget about it. One night, my mother woke up to the phone ringing. You know that state of being half awake, where you take a few moments to process anything, and you're not sure if you're in a dream? That's how she described what was happening. She picked it up and heard no dial tone, only the continued ringing of the phone, before she realised it wasn't ringing in the regular pattern of long, short, short, more like a completely irregular sequence of half rings and drawn out ones. This happened a few more times before she'd woken up enough to sit up in bed and notice that she thought it was daylight outside and was actually a sky so solidly bright purple, it was luminescent, accompanied by the sound we can only describe as the noise made by the TARDIS in Doctor Who. She said this half laughing. The electric radio clock next to the phone flashed something around 3.15am, but it was clearly broken, as if the power had gone out despite the phone ringing. And needed to be reset. By this time, my dad had also woken up and confirmed that they were both seeing and hearing the same thing. Somehow, and without any further memory, they both went back to sleep. The next morning, there was no evidence of what happened, except the radio clock needing to be reset. No other appliances in the house were affected. My bedroom is an attic-style space on the other side of the house, and the only way to get up to me 
is to climb up a ladder, as I like being high, as it makes me feel safe. My mum asked me tentatively if I had any weird dreams, and apparently that night I dreamt I was flying. My dreams have always been surreally vivid. There was a period of time after learning about this story, I was seriously worried I may have been abducted, and I'm starting to worry that they're going to come back for me. My husband and I recently moved out of Georgia, but before we left, we were staying at his parents' house. His parents' house is newly built, so it doesn't really seem like the type of place to be feeling like something is out of place. At his parents' house, they have cameras everywhere. They both are police officers. Like I said, it doesn't feel like the kind of place something would go wrong. Around three days before our move out of state, it was roughly around 9.30 at night, as I was using the restroom and craving a snack. So after I went into our bedroom where we were staying, which is a finished basement, I persuaded my husband into getting a snack with me. I walked out of the room first, but as I got to the door of our bedroom, I got the feeling like someone was behind it. So I slowly opened the door and looked behind it. Nothing was there. So I shrugged it off, closed the door, and continued into the kitchen. A few minutes later, my husband came into the kitchen and asked if I was hiding behind the door before he opened it. I told him no, but that I felt like someone was also behind the door as I opened it. I forgot to mention this earlier. His dad was on duty, and his mum was with one of his siblings at one of their football games, so essentially we were alone. We both felt uneasy, but let it go. His siblings and his mum came home 15 to 20 minutes later, and we forgot about it. Fast forward to us living in our new apartment. I forgot to mention, but we have a dog, Alex, who's a pointer, and we have a cat, Freya. And just a little insight by apartment. It's basically a townhouse. We have a garage and an upstairs. No one is below or under us. We've been living in the apartment for about four months. And every now and then, Alex will look up into the attic and slightly turn his head. And sometimes all the hairs on his back will stand up like no tomorrow. And he will get in this defensive mode. Freya's eyes will go wide, and she'll creep around to wherever Alex is staring. Some may think this is completely normal for a hunting dog and a domestic cat, but not to me, as I'm the one who's been with them since birth, and have a little more knowledge on how they normally act. And since I do, I'll give my point of view on how they normally are. Alex, he's the sweetest, most gentle dog you'll ever meet. He loves Freya and small babies. He lets dogs rough him up at the park because he's just too gentle and will not fight back. Freya is laid back and doesn't care. She acts like a 20 year old cat, but barely a year old. Anyway, continuing on. The other day, my husband was in our home office and he thought I'd snuck up on him and was hovering over his shoulder. But when he turned around, I wasn't there and he realised I was still at work. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. I saw an alien. No joke. To this day, I still wonder if I was somehow tripping on something I ate. I was about 10 years old and was playing in my room by myself. It was about 11pm. I had a sliding glass door in my room, and the blinds were pulled back. Out of nowhere, the automatic spotlight behind my house turned on. I looked to the sliding glass door, and a figure started approaching the door. 
At first, I thought it was my neighbor, who was older than me, and about the same height. But as it got closer, I realized it was something else. I remember it approaching the door slowly. It stopped at the sliding glass door for a few seconds, and just started staring at me. It felt like an eternity passed by. Like, I remember specifically how long it felt, when in reality, it was probably only a few seconds. I remember it was dark black. It had a rounded head, just like you see in the movies, and was about six foot tall. Two arms, two legs, really skinny. The only thing is, that it was so close to me right on the other side of the glass, that there's no way I could have mistaken it for a human. I know what I saw. After a few seconds of staring at me, it just turned to the side and walked away. Long strides. It went out of view, and I immediately ran out of my room and screamed for my mum. She didn't believe me. I had to sleep in my room that night, knowing I had seen a legit alien a few feet away from me earlier. I'm now 23, and to this day I still get chills when I think about it. My eyes always start watering when I do think of it. I know it was not a dream. I know what I saw. But alas, no one believes me. The thing that creeps me out the most was its demeanor. I remember it coming slowly up to me and walking slowly away. That's what scares me the most. Like there's no rush. It was just watching me. I believe in aliens, but I don't really believe in aliens visiting Earth. So it's been quite hard to cope with. I think what I saw is what people call a grey. If anyone else has seen anything like it, I'd love to hear about it. When I was 13, my mum decided I would be going to military boarding school. It was located north of Mexico in a place called Durango. Durango is known because it is home to many creepy things, drug cartels, the zone of silence, ghost towns, UFO sightings and the like. I was in that school for around six years. And one day, a friend invited me and other students to go to his hometown to have some tacos with his dad, a well-known rancher. When we arrived to the town, we were on his house having some drinks, and eventually he decided it was time to go. We hopped into his pickup truck, and he began driving right when the sun was setting. After about half an hour, everything was dark, and he had to turn on the headlights. I was on the front seat with my friend, and we've just arrived to the place. He slowed down his car, and we could hear the nocturnal wildlife and some scratches on the car from branches and plants. The headlights allowed us to see just enough to distinguish shapes. He stopped the car right in front of a little lake, and we could see some bushes and trees around the water. A few meters in front of the right headlight, we could see what we thought was a rock. The guys started unloading the truck while they joked around. My friend and I were still in the front smoking, when all of a sudden he said, Did you see that? While he pointed to the rock in front of the car with the tip of the cigarette. That just moved. Since I've always wanted to see something paranormal, I remained still. We were both looking at this rock when all of a sudden, the thing turned its head to face us with, I thought, what looked like the face of Gollum. Big, round, yellow eyes, an arched back. And I turned to my friend, he grabbed his gun and quickly got out of the car and fired two shots into the sky. All of this while people are still unloading the truck and making a fire for the grill and such. I heard a few scream. 
I saw how this creature looked up to the sky, turned around, and hopped into the water. Right after that, everyone began asking, what happened? My friend told us that it was actually a common sight. He explained that his father and grandfather often saw the creature when they were hunting. He said that they called it Hombre Rana, or Frogman. Just a few of the guys saw the thing. We still had the tacos and everything. We were a little creeped out, but we assumed that the Frogman was probably more scared of us than we were of him. I saw many terrifying, creepy and odd things in Durango, but the Frogman takes the cake. Let me start off by saying that this is not my story, but it was such a crazy encounter that I have since asked each of my friends throughout the years to recount the events. This happened around the year 2000. About a year after this took place, I started dating one of these friends, and that's when I first heard about this dog slash wolf story. I have since asked each friend over the years and miles apart, and they all remember the encounter the very same way. Before my ex was even my boyfriend, he and our other friends were all about 17 to 18 years old. At that age, I remember it being an adventure to find a place to smoke. Let's hike to this place and puff. Ah, the good old days. The four of them decided to drive to Mount Pisgah a beautiful wooded area outside of Eugene, Oregon. It's more of a hill, but it's nature in its prime form for sure. I've been out there many times growing up, and I know exactly what trail they were on. It was Jay, my ex-boyfriend, and his best friend, Barry, and their girlfriends, Sarah and Mary. They had driven in Barry's little white sedan, parked in the parking lot, and hiked the trail to the river where they smoked some bowls. The group spent the day out there swimming, puffing, puffing and swimming, just being typical teenagers. I can imagine the hunger is what drove them to go home after a few hours, as the sun began to set. Either activity alone is bound to get someone hungry, let alone both. So they walked along the well-worn main dirt path to the parking lot. This has since been paved, and it doesn't take not 20 minutes for them to get back to the little footbridge by the parking lot that they had crossed when they hiked in. When they reached this small footbridge near the parking lot, Barry looked out into the vast fields between them and the wooded area and noticed a huge dog. The dog was just sitting there, not looking scary, just looking like a humongous friendly dog about 70 yards away. It was starting to get dark, but from Mary's description and the drawing she did later for me in 2005, it was very shaggy and furry. My friends continued to walk across this small wooden bridge, and one of the girls screamed. The big dog was now on its hind legs, standing much closer than when they had seen it a few seconds earlier. It had traversed most of the large field in the seconds it took them to get past the 10 foot long bridge. Whatever this thing was, it was fast, quiet, and stealthy. My four friends ran to the car and they had the classic cliche, I can't get the key in because Barry was fumbling madly for the keys. At this point, the dog was just standing at the very edge of the parking lot, looking at them. As my ex Jay had said, every time they looked up, he would be closer, but not moving. All of them recounted how surreal it was to see a dog standing on its hind legs. I don't know if it ran for a few ticks and then stood up again at intervals in the field, but that's the way they describe it. Many times I asked them, are you sure it wasn't a bear? Nope, it was definitely a dog standing on its hind legs a big dog that was stalking them. This is in the Lane County, Oregon in the year 2000. There are few, if any, bears out there. It would be odd, but then again, I wasn't there. The kids got in the car, sped off, leaving the pigs dog to do its own business. 
I've never had any reason to doubt any of their stories. In fact, Sarah doesn't like to talk about the incident because it's just too creepy for her to recall. The following stories are from an uncle on my mother's side. He's a considerably conservative man in his approach to most things, from political to taste in film, as he generally considers any cinema post-1950s to be absolute garbage. And I feel I should mention his disdain for the genres of horror and science fiction in entertainment before I continue. That said, I was surprised when a few years ago, I made a passing comment regarding alien abduction. For the life of me, I have no idea what prompted this. And he spoke seriously, and mentioned two encounters of his own. He seemed excited to share the stories, and enjoyed me listening to them. The first took place inside of a flat he rented in the mid-80s. The location was Stretford Road, Manchester, UK. Apparently, my uncle looks out of his bedroom window when a flying saucer appears directly opposite and sits still in the air. There are a row of windows separating the top and bottom of this saucer and inside are the shapes of people moving around. The saucer idles for around 10 seconds and then completely disappears. To this day, he claims the story to be genuine. Then, around the mid-80s, somewhere in Manchester, UK, my uncle used to be a mechanic. He was working at a friend's car at home, and needed a particular part, as the one he's looking at is severely damaged. He takes the part to another garage, hoping to negotiate price on a replacement and asks the only guy working there if he has one. The guy smiles, takes the part from my uncle, and then returns 10 seconds later with the same part, and one completely identical. By identical, I mean that my uncle described it as a duplicate of the original, damaged in the exact same places, with the same blemishes and tells. Confused, my uncle takes the part from the mechanic, and as he studied them, the mechanic bursts into hysterics. Thinking it's a prank, my uncle calls Bull, and asks where he got the part, to which the mechanic replies that he made it. My uncle left the shop with both parts, dumbfounded as how the mechanic had produced the identical part. Without reason, my uncle insists that this mechanic was an alien or something otherworldly. But I always thought his mind was tilted towards this explanation as per his alleged saucer experience. As for a possible explanation, it makes sense that car parts would be subject to similar examples of damage, and perhaps the mechanic in question noticed my uncle's part looked uncannily similar to one of his own and saw room for a prank. Certainly explains the laughter. I'll have to apologize for the sparsity of detail in this one. I regret it was hard to find these out. I always thought of this story as its best to be weird and at its worst to be casually explainable. So as a kid, I loved to burn spiders. It's something that now I think of, and it sounds horrifying, but at that age I didn't even care. So as soon as I found a spider, I let my mother know, and she would burn it with an enormous lighter. I don't really know how many times, or how many spiders we incinerated, but my bet is that it's an enormous amount. It's worth noting that when you burn a spider, it gets stiff, and the legs get rolled in. And at the end, you get a sphere-shaped spider. And if you pay close attention, you will hear the crunching of the poor little thing. This was the main procedure whenever I found a spider. And it was fun for me and my brothers, except for the one spider. The last one we burnt. 
I remember that I was playing with my brother. We were running all over the house, and we suddenly saw a spider. It was the most ugly thing in the world. Thin legs, yellow, with black and green stripes all over it. It was the biggest spider I have ever seen so far. Not that big to be a tarantula though. So we run back to the kitchen where my mother was. We told her that we had found a spider. At this point, she knew what to do already, so we didn't have to tell her. She picks the lighter and goes with us. The spider was standing on the corner of a room. My mum uses the lighter, and as soon as the flame touches the spider, we hear this extremely loud scream all over the room, and only inside that room. It was like a baby screaming. Remember that I told you it was worth noting what happens to spiders when they get burnt? Well, this spider was different. It literally turned into dust, black and extremely thin, and there was no trace of the spider. I mean, not even a half burnt leg, it just completely turned to dust. From that day on, if I happened to find a spider, let's say that I'm at my friend's house, I kind of feel something in the corner, and guess what? There'd be a spider there. There's also a lot of spider activity in my bathroom. My father finishes his shower, and he actually checks to see if there are any insects before, and after the experience, I can't stand spiders, and I get paralyzed whenever I see one. And after he would check, he'd go out of the bathroom, and when I would get in, I'd remove the curtain, and there would be a spider in the middle of the tub, as if it were waiting for me. Here in Mexico, there are legends of Nahuales, which are humans that can turn into animals and insects, and that there are some people who believe that I may have burnt one. Since it was like a baby screaming, people say it might also be a baby that was turned into a spider by a witch. What do you think? As for my fear of spiders, I can't do much. I have also seen some experts, and they do not believe this story. So their therapies don't seem to work, which I understand, and I also accept the spider sighting like a punishment, for having been so aggressive with them in the past. The spider thing only happens with me, not my brother or my mother. I think it was because I was the one who enjoyed it the most. But I will never know. Years ago, when I was 13 years old, I went on a trip to celebrate Easter with my mum's family. It was a tradition for us to go have a picnic in the middle of a big field, 40 minutes from my grandma's house. The field is basically in the middle of nowhere in rural Mexico. That day, my cousins and I got very curious about a small hill we could see from the field. It always caught our attention because it looks like a giant took a big bite out of it. I know it used to work as a rock mine several years prior. And anyway, we decided to go investigate and left the picnic. We walked for 20 minutes until we crossed a road and went up a hill. Once there, we started looking for a way to trespass a metallic fence that kept us from going into the actual mine, and eventually we found a hole in it. My cousin was recording with her cell phone as we were making jokes and acting like normal cringy teenagers, when suddenly she froze and whispered, Hey, there's something in the rocks and she pointed her camera to the rock wall behind us. At first I thought she was joking, but something about her expression seemed off. So I turned back, and there was a human dog-like hybrid looking at us from a hole in the rocks, about 20 to 30 meters above the ground. It had pink, pale, and wrinkly skin, and a long snout and long ears, white eyes, and hands with long fingernails. It had no hair, and it kept still just watching us. After what felt like an eternity, the weird creature finally went into the hole again, and we started running back to the picnic spot. We showed the video to our family right after being scolded for going so far without saying anything to anyone, but you could barely see anything on the video. After all these years, I still don't know what that thing was, 
and I get goosebumps when I think about it. The mother of my best friend had a brother working on that mine in the 70s or so, and she claims that he and other workers died there, but the families never got the bodies back. Apparently rocks collapsed multiple times killing the people working, and making it very difficult to retrieve the corpses. Well, that's what the owners of the mine said to all the families involved. After a few incidents, they decided to close the mine for good. This is one of the things that I remember almost as if it happened yesterday. I'm from Mexico. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of folklore slash legends from around these parts. This event happened a year ago. I don't remember my age, but I was probably around eight, and I am now 19. As a kid, I was very scared of the paranormal, and I can recall a couple of times, something of the matter happening to me, but I have no proof, only vivid memories. At the time, I was quite friendly with the neighbor's kid. I even stayed in their house a few times and did some traveling with them. There was one time we went to a little village called Chelma that is known for being very religious and having religious migration there. So we usually went to pray and then wash ourselves with the water from a special kind of tree and our wet there. Either way, on the road to the village, there's a fairly dense forest of pines. And being the shy person that I am, I usually just look out the window. And after a few minutes, just watching the trees, I saw a big black silhouette that was about two meters tall. It had red glowing eyes like a canine that you would expect from a werewolf. At first, I thought I was seeing things, so I just kept turning my head and checking my vision. The road we were going on meant that we were traveling at about 50 miles an hour, and going at this speed didn't make things look like we were traveling very fast. I kept watching it for two minutes, then it turned its eyes at me, looked at me, and as soon as I did, I reached for my friend and told him to look that way. He said there was nothing, but when I looked back, it was there. This happened at least three times until it just disappeared. I didn't tell anyone this story until years later. I thought it could be a Nawal or something like that, but there's the absence of proof. I'm kind of skeptical about this, but I'd love to hear anyone's opinions on what it could be. My mom, my sister-in-law and I are all lying on the ground watching the Perseids meteor shower. I see a plane in the sky, only its lights aren't blinking like they normally would in a plane. Hey guys, I think that might actually be a satellite. And since this is the age of technology and Insta answers, my mum pulls out her smartphone, looks up a list of visible satellites passing over our location that night, and it turns out that plane is actually the International Space Station reflecting sunlight back at us, which is totally wicked cool. And there's supposed to be another satellite passing over in about an hour or something. So I'm like, hell yeah, let's find it. But not in so many words since, you know, I'm talking to my mum. Anyway, we continue to watch the meteor shower for the next 15 minutes or whatever. And while keeping an eye out for this next satellite to make its sluggish way across the sky, it hasn't even been a half hour yet, when I swear I see another non-blinking plane-like object in the sky in the general direction of the magic satellite chart. So we're like, okay, maybe it's ahead of schedule, cool. And we're all standing up walking around to get a better view because you know, trees and whatnot. And all three of us are staring intently at this satellite, probably not even blinking, when it starts getting bigger. And the sudden realization hits us that it's not getting bigger, it's getting closer. Like, holy hell, it's gonna crash and we're all gonna die. I've never burnt those stupid notebooks from seventh grade, that's gonna be my only legacy. I'm about to ditch my family and book it the hell out of there. 
my sister-in-law who is scared out of her mind, of stuff like this and anything that's out of her control, is running in circles like in the cartoons. All the while my mum just starts standing there, chill as hell, when this thing changes its mind and turns the hell around and starts moving away from us and slowly starts to disappear. Minutes later, we saw the satellite we were originally looking for come in from one of the edges of the horizon and disappear over the other. I don't know what the hell that first thing was, but it didn't move fast and direct like a meteor, and it didn't blink or emit noises like a plane. My mum's convinced it was some kind of test flight of a military aircraft, since there's a military camp nearby, and I'm inclined to agree with her, but my sister-in-law swears she felt the air get hot as it moved closer. I did too, and I just chalk it up to adrenaline. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area, main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight, if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette, moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost, some insanely efficient Olympic track runner, I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird. I was visiting my cousin's house. I have four cousins, two twin girls aged 10, and then the older brother aged 21, and other older brother aged 26. I was sleeping in the room with the cousin of my age, 21. We heard things falling in the girl's room, right next to where we were. We assumed it was just them playing, but one of them started talking to the other, and they were across the room. So my cousin stepped out of the room to go check, and I watched over his shoulders through the doorway. Right as the girls were explaining that stuff was falling without provocation, a sort of humanoid type thing came bursting out the closet. It looked humanesque, but was much longer and thinner and ran on all four legs. It ran out the house, broke the front door hinge, and straight through the screen door. We called the police immediately, and they were there within five minutes. 
They looked in a five mile radius and nothing was found. They gathered DNA from the door, as apparently the thing was cut by shattering wood on the door, as there was still a small amount of blood on it. They ran tests, and it was determined to be inconclusive. They said it was similar to human DNA, but not in the way ape DNA is similar. It wasn't a human though, they knew that much. So to this day, we have had no incidents with whatever this thing is. They still live in the house, have no problems, but we have zero explanation for what happened, and what the thing was, and how it got into the house. It was back in about fourth grade. I couldn't have been older than eight or nine. I lived in the country near a small Minnesotan town called Iyota, and it was pretty out there in the middle of nowhere. At about 6.50 in the morning, I got on the bus, like I would any other day to head to school. I had an hour long morning ride, and an hour long evening ride. About three quarters of the way there, we went down a side street. A kid named Jacob lived there, and there were about three houses in total down the street. In between the houses were open fields. As Jacob was picked up, I looked on the opposing side of the road, and saw three figures like I had never seen before next to a white house. They were black, long, lanky. They looked almost like panthers, but distorted in some way. They were much bigger than panthers, and their faces were almost pointed at the bottom. They looked almost reptilian. It was difficult to see details in the morning fog. They crawled on all fours, and one of them looked to be a bit smaller than the other two. One of the big ones walked ahead a little bit, and waited for the other two to catch up. They disappeared behind the house, and I scrambled for my little blackberry hoping to catch a picture. But as we moved away from the house, there was no sight of them. I thought about what I had just seen, and didn't particularly know what to think. I told my friend Erica about it, and she didn't flat out tell me she thought I was lying, but I could feel it. The house is now gone. It must have been demolished, and it was fairly old and looked to be in fairly bad shape when the incident occurred. Though, I am not, and I've never really been religious. I did have a fair amount of strange occurrences happen in my childhood, this being one of the biggest. For the past seven years or so, I have pushed it to the back of my mind, but every now and then it will come up. As I was listening to a podcast mentioning skinwalkers, I thought of this experience, and thought I would share it with you guys for help. If anybody has any clues as to what this could be, please do let me know. My family moved from the Maryland Mountains to West Palm Beach, Florida, when I was seven. Waterbeds were trendy at the time, so everyone in the house had one. On a few occasions, I would wake up to this odd smell in the air. I couldn't put my finger on how to describe it as a kid, so my folks didn't think much of it, and said it was the plastic waterbeds I was smelling. One night in particular sticks out in my mind, where I woke up to that weird odour, but there was someone with me. I thought it was my dad, because he told me he would be in to check on me. When I rolled over to look, I was caught completely off guard by… snake people. Three of them. Their faces looked like a snake-human hybrid, and they had big, slitted eyes. I doubt they were more than three and a half feet tall, and they were watching me. I was frozen in fear staring back at them, while my waterbed sloshed from me rolling over. Next thing I know, it's morning, and I'm eating breakfast. Years later, my mother and I are out taking a walk. It looks like it's gonna storm any minute and there's a strong smell of ozone in the air. She looks at me and says, that's the same smell from when the aliens took you. And she tells me about when we first moved to Florida, 
three little lizard men took me to a saucer in our yard. She wanted to stop them at first, but they convinced her I would be okay and wouldn't remember anything. So she went back to her bedroom and watched the saucer go into the sky from the window, leaving that strong ozone smell. After that, she went back to bed and apparently never thought to tell me until I was 30. Now, every time I smell a storm coming, I get the willies. I live in Mexico, a country well known for its rich culture. However, many foreigners don't know about Mexico's paranormal scene. I work as an English teacher, and sometimes I include conversation topics as part of my activities in the class. It is very common for Mexicans to start talking about paranormal stuff at school. There are even teachers who share their experiences from time to time. So, I decided to include a conversation about the paranormal in my class. As I expected, participation in the class rose, and everyone wanted to share their own experiences. Seeing that this activity was amusing and highly effective, I decided to repeat it in many of my groups. I got experiences about ghosts as usual, but something new came across. Nowales. Some people declare that things happened to them, and others claimed that some things happened to friends or relatives. Nawales are people who can transform into animals, or maybe animals who can transform into animal humans, who knows. An experience with a Nawal is pretty much the same as always. People are having fun at night, might be at a party or just outside their home, and then someone comes seeking problems. It looks like a drunkard who just wants to fight or steal things, but after feeling threatened, it changes its shape. The most common animal tends to be a dog. I'm shocked by the fact that many people just told me this. This isn't on TV or over the internet. Bear in mind, my students are old folks who are engineers now, and I go to their companies and teach them English. So I have the opportunity to speak about this with people from different backgrounds of all walks of life, who certainly don't know each other. Even one of my students told me about how a friend got traumatized after seeing a man transform into a dog, and how this friend couldn't speak for three days because he was in shock. Let it be known that a lot of crazy stuff happens within this country. When I was about 11, I was living with my grandmother. My bed was in the corner of my room, with the long side against the wall, and right up against the window. I slept with my head towards the wall, and I was usually turning towards the wall with the window. This window was a weird size, and didn't have any blinds, just curtains. The curtains hung in front of the window, so there was a small gap towards the side of the window where you could see into or out of my room if you were standing at the right angle. I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep when I turned my eyes towards the window and saw something standing there looking right at me. It was just a silhouette, but something about the way it was shaped just felt wrong. The head was large, the body was a little too skinny, and the way it was bent over just didn't feel right at all. I tried to act like I was asleep, and rolled over ever so slightly to try and get a better look, but it stood back up and ran away. It was tall, at least six foot. I hopped out of bed, and ran into the living room where my grandmother was watching the 10 o'clock news. I told her I'd seen someone looking into my window. She grabbed a flashlight and ran out. I followed her, and we looked around, trying to figure out what it was. We couldn't see anything at all, and after that night, we set the curtains further back 
so they completely blocked out the window. Last night, my fiancé and I saw something so weird. We were driving to Charlotte from Florida. We passed by some town, I think it was York, and we were on the interstate. We noticed something that looked like three streetlights, kind of in a triangle form. However, we didn't see the pole. It was in a construction zone, so I expected it to be just random construction stuff. We were driving for maybe five minutes and we never actually got closer to the lights. I was keeping a close eye on them because it had now caught my attention. A fast light came from the left of the sky that was kind of smaller, zooming across and then a 90 degree angle swooped down right in front of the three lights. Then the furthest light on the end suddenly got three times its original size and dissolved. AKA got super small all of a sudden while zooming to the top and right of the sky. The two were still there, but then faded and zooped to the top left of the sky. I can't really understand what I saw, but I swear on my life I've never seen any plane go as fast as they went and the angles that they zoomed at so sharply. I was about nine or 10. It was late at night and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out looking up at the sky when I saw what looked like a UFO. It was a white orb, rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles and shot away. It came back and did the same thing, only it was closer and larger and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out and walked from my room around the corner and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly, I heard someone coming up the stairs and a snorting sound. I looked down and all I saw was this tall slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? But then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large black eyes, and got right up into my face, continuing to make that awful snorting sound. Kind of like a pig. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I just collapsed as it towered over me and bent down pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there, and I said that I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face and that snorting sound and I think I'll die of a heart attack if I ever see it again. My dad's uncle and his family live in rural Louisiana, but not too rural in a way. Anyway, both my dad, my brother and I travel there, and I came here when I was younger, so it was nothing new, and I was around 15 at the time. The second day rolls around and it's 4am at night. I begin to start hearing an eerie sound that sounded like a trumpet, but I was too tired, fell back asleep and thought nothing of it. Now the third day is when stuff gets weird. While my dad and uncle went out to buy groceries, it was just me and my brother and my dad's aunt at the house. So being smart intellectuals, we decide to go off down the woods off a beaten trail until we see a big, ragged white house on the other side of the swamp. It looked fairly abandoned, so we go around the lake and see a bunch of old cars with motors running. We immediately go back and tell my aunt, and she thinks nothing of it. That night, we heard loud screaming and chanting coming from the direction of the house. 
it starts getting closer and closer, until we see a bunch of hillbillies around our house, with lighters and small torches. I'm freaked the hell out, and proceed to hide. In Louisiana, hillbillies with torches who tell you to evacuate the area are best listened to. So my aunt does as told, and we think they're gonna loot the house. So my aunt and older brother go up to their supposed leaders of this group of 20 to 30 people and ask what's happening. They claim their son has been taken and transformed into a Rougarou, which is like a werewolf standing up. The next day, their son is found brutally ripped apart, with claw marks and slashes all over his body. Yeah, never again. I was about nine or 10. It was late at night, and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out looking up at the sky, when I saw what appeared to be an unidentified flying object. It was a white orb, rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles, then shot away. It came back and did the same thing, only it was closer and larger and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out and walked from my room around the corner and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly I heard someone coming up the stairs and a snorting sound. I looked down and saw this tall slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? but then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large, black eyes, and got right up into my face, continuing to make that awful snorting sound, kind of like the sound a pig makes. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I just collapsed, as it towered over me and bent down, pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there, and I said I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face, and that snorting sound. I think I'll die of a heart attack, if I ever see it again. This story has been passed down through my family. They called it the Indian's Devil. All I know is that my great 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 grandfather was courting his wife and had to walk 12 miles up the old island road. The story goes that something jumped out of the trees at him. It had the hands and feet and face of a man but the body of an ape. It followed him for miles, mocking him and then running away. The local Aboriginal people call it a devil and always told their children to stay close or it might snatch them. They knew this thing. So I asked Grampy what happened and he said that my great 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 grandpa was so upset that he took to his bed for four days. He then got a bunch of men together and they tracked it down and shot it. For context, this is Australia. I was traveling to this campsite about 20 minutes past a small town and had gotten there about an hour-ish after dark. Now I was the only person there. And when I called the offsite caretaker to book, he said that since it was just me, that I could use the day shelter slash kitchen. So instead of setting up my tent in the dark, I decided to drag my sleeping bag inside where I had some actual light. Hours later, I realized I require something from my car. So I drag open the sliding door, and this wasn't a small door. It was one of those big loud ones like you would see on a barn. I was looking out into the darkness as there were no lights or moon 
just the glow from the lights behind me. Now in case you've never been in a situation like this, when the light reaches about 10 meters, there has to be about one meter where it drops off into nothingness. And in this small patch, I saw four legs. These were not just normal legs. They were those of a dog and long like human legs. They were bright white and stretched up to where they could connect to the body of the animal. But there was nothing there. Then it began to move. The legs walked. They walked in parallel to the building, making sure that they remained in the grey corridor, then disappeared into the darkness. I decided that I didn't really need to get whatever it was from my car, and slept barricaded in the tiny office. To this day, I don't know what they were, and I have looked into it, nor do I know how long they were there before I saw it. But I do know that the thing was smart enough to know how humans see, and where the grey corridor was from my viewpoint. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area, main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight, if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time, I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette, moving very fast. It finally disappeared, over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really really weird. Let me take you back five months when the whole Storm Area 51 craze was happening. It was on the news and I was sitting there with my grandma. Unbothered, she looks at me and goes, you know, aliens landed on our local beach in the 70s. They keep their ship hidden under the sand. That's why we haven't had hurricanes since. Now listen y'all, my grandma is very old school, conservative, religious, and doesn't even joke around. When she said this, I thought she was joking. But she went back to watching the news like she hadn't said anything. And for context, my aunt is one of my neighbours. Later, when I went to check my mail, I saw my aunt sitting on her lawn and went to tell her what grandma said. Again, unbothered, my aunt goes, yeah, that's true. That's why part of the beach is sectioned off. I thought for sure this was some kind of elaborate prank. But later I saw another neighbour and told them the craziness and they agreed. I looked it up and there were a bunch of news stories from the town claiming that the major reason storms won't hit my area, even though we're in a high risk zone for hurricanes, is because of the aliens protecting their ship. Out back of my own 30 acre property, there is a big grove of eucalyptus trees. I was walking out there to get to the river because me and my friends were going to drink some beer and generally chill by the river. But when we walked by the trees, that I've walked by thousands of times before with no weirdness, I thought I saw a little kid peeking out from one of the bigger trees. So. 
I told my friends to look right there where the kid or whatever it was, was hiding. And about a four foot tall humanoid thing peeked out with its pale white like greyish colour. It had a weird head. And honestly, that's about as descriptive as I could be. As the moment I saw it, my hair stood up and I ran as fast as I could back to my house to grab a gun. We still go past those trees to get to the river, but never do so without firearms. I wish I had not been so scared because I feel like I should have filmed it. I am now in my late 60s. The experience I'll briefly relate here took place on the southern Gold Coast in Queensland in 1984. Our house was less than 10 years old, as were all the others in the area. At the time the event took place, I was divorced and lived in the house with my two young children. I am neither a drinker of alcohol nor a user of drugs. They have never been a part of my life. I had no interest in fairies, goblins, gnomes, elves, or the like, nor have I been reading about them or watching anything about them on TV. If asked if I believe in the little people, I would have unhesitatingly replied no. In 1984, I attended a seminar in New Zealand, along with several dozen other Aussies. I'd recently developed a fear of plane travel, although previously I'd enjoyed it. A local chemist whom I knew had given me three or four tablets to take an hour before departure to settle my nerves. I took one prior to our departure from New Zealand. Consequently, I slept from New Zealand to Sydney where we changed planes. And I slept from Sydney to Brisbane, then slept through the drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. The driver, a colleague, carried my suitcase into my home. He conducted a cursory check on the premises before departing. My children were all in the care of a neighbour. It was very rare to have a night to myself. Being well rested and relaxed, I was looking forward to spending a few hours reading or watching TV. First, I made a cup of tea. The television was on, the front main door was open, but the security screen catch was locked. As I sipped the tea, I decided I may as well unpack. I carried an armload of clothes into my bedroom and hung them in my wardrobe. I noticed the light in the room seemed unusually bright. Something was strange about the atmosphere. I had no time to analyze it before I was overcome with exhaustion so intense that I only had time to stagger backwards into bed. I lay face up on the bed. I was concerned my shoes might make a mark on the bedspread. I looked down to make sure only my heels were resting on the bedspread, and that was that. I lost consciousness. Next I knew I could hear the sounds of several voices. They were argumentative voices that seemed to tell each other to hurry. I managed to lift my head and look down to the source of the voices. There were several small people. They were trying to pull me from the bed, feet first and into the wardrobe. The wardrobe was only half a metre approx from the foot of the bed, and I saw that the left hand side of the wardrobe was open. The wardrobe had two sliding doors. I'd hung the clothes on the right hand side, which had required both wardrobe doors to be pushed to the left. And now, the little people were trying to pull me into the left hand side which would have required someone to push both doors to the right. I should explain here that during the event, I must have been operating similar to a video camera in that I saw and heard only, and what I saw and heard must have been committed to memory. At the time, however, I did not experience normal thought process. So what I remembered after and now is the product of my mental video camera. At the time, it did not dawn on me that the doors had been moved. I simply saw several small people trying to pull me from the bed and into the open half of the wardrobe. I experienced no shock or alarm. Instead, I told myself I had lots of time to continue sleeping because I was far too big and heavy for them to move very far. Now, I am of the opinion those thoughts were not my own, 
but were in some way suggested to me. Whatever the case, I must have lost consciousness again, because the next thing I can remember is waking up to find several people crowded around me. They didn't speak as far as I know. I was now lying with my head at the foot of the bed, so my feet must have been at the head of the bed. Again, I was similar to a video camera. I have very clear memory of how these people appeared. There were males and females. I can't remember how many, but at least six or more. One, a male, was larger than the others and appeared to be their leader. He was closest to me. At first, he stared into my eyes with both of his. Then, a blank, and his position had changed, and he was looking at me with only one of his eyes. Something happened there, but I can't remember. I suspect he was imparting something to me. The creature appeared as the typical gnomes or peasants from storybooks. Based on the height of the bed, their height was perhaps two to three and a half feet tall. They were overdressed. Their clothing was suited to a much colder climate. I can remember that in considerable detail, possibly because in those days I did a lot of home sewing. They were Caucasian, their skin looked weathered as if they worked outdoors a lot, and their skin had a muddy cast. They had strong facial bones, wide cheekbones, wide jaws, strong chins and noses. Their eyes and mouths were long horizontally, but vertically narrow and seemed recessed between the strong facial bones. The best way to describe their faces is as squashed, as if a heavy weight had been placed on top of their heads, squashing them downwards. Their bodies were stout, robust, with deep cut chests, broad waists and strong shoulders. I couldn't see the bottom half too well, and I must have lost consciousness again, because when I saw them next, I was still in the same position, but they were now in the centre of the room looking at me. I looked back at them and still felt no fear nor alarm. I just looked at them and they at me. I had no thought process at the time. There seemed to be more of them than before. Among them were a couple of younger males who seemed a bit more nervous or unsure. The other men were impassive. The women, however, seemed to enjoy my predicament. Based on my mental video recording, I later regarded them as overworked, joyless, and not overintelligent. It seemed I was simply a job to them, and they seemed a bit nervous. Next, I was aware of their voices again. As before, querulously talking over the top of each other and arguing to hurry. I raised my head, and to my alarm, I saw that they'd almost succeeded in pulling my legs from the bed. My body was now right way up on the bed, with my head against the head of the bed and my feet near the wardrobe. When I'd seen that they almost pulled all of my legs from the bed, a surge of adrenaline shot through me, and I grasped that it couldn't be much longer before gravity did the rest of the job for them. All they'd have to do would be to steer my falling body into the wardrobe. I yelled out and kicked at them. Then I jumped from the bed and into the centre of the room. The room seemed far too bright, and I remember standing there yelling at them. I still wasn't afraid, I was angry. They muttered between themselves, and they looked and sounded resigned and bitter. Then they fled into the open half of the wardrobe. They seemed to go in, then down, as if filing down a ramp inside the wardrobe. I stood there watching them for probably a few seconds. Then, still, with the light seeming far brighter than usual, I turned towards the only door and left the room. It was only a small house, the hallway was only three or four metres long, and I left the room, went through the hallway towards the living room, and that's when I became completely consumed with terror. Nothing happened between yelling at the creatures and making it towards the living room. But in those few seconds, I was overtaken by sheer horror, which seemed to escalate with every instant. I've never known fear like it, yet there was no real reason for it. I suspect now that when the creatures departed, they removed whatever calming influence they'd subjected me to during the ordeal itself. After phoning the colleague who dropped me off earlier that evening, I stumbled out of the house and into the middle of the road. 
I was desperate to be with someone and was moaning in the hopes that someone could come and rescue me. I was completely without shame and must have been reduced to the level of a small child, but I must stress that I wasn't afraid, consciously at least, that the little creatures would return and attack me. There wasn't a real focus for the terror, it just was. Horror feeding into more horror. Not long after, my colleague returned and drove me to his house. He didn't speak to me, I didn't care, I was just glad to be with someone and to be getting away from my house. When we arrived at his place, I got into bed but couldn't get warm. He put a pile of blankets on top of me but I was still freezing. Now I realise I was in shock. I wouldn't let him leave the room or turn off the lights. I must have fallen asleep. When I awoke, he wasn't there. Next morning, he wouldn't discuss any of it. I was anxious, he thought I'd gone insane and tried to explain what happened. He didn't want to talk about it, but he did say that he'd never seen anyone as terrified as I had been when he saw me in the road. We never discussed it again. Despite that, we married the following year. When I asked him how long had elapsed between when he dropped me off after our return from New Zealand and receiving my phone call asking to come and get me, it seemed the entire experience of the little people had been no more than 15 minutes. In approximately 2004, I decided to submit an account of the experience in the 20 years which had elapsed. I had searched in the hopes of discovering others that had had similar experiences without success. There was no internet then, of course, so I was reliant on books. I found only one mention in a book by Jenny Randalls who said 7% of aliens had been described as looking like gnomes. It was a relief to discover. I was not alone in my experience, although I did not believe the creatures I'd seen to be an extraterrestrial. When I decided in 2004 to leave a record of my experience somewhere, I didn't know where to submit it. Finally, I chose an organisation which was UFO Research Group in Queensland, the QLD. The QLD Research Group replied to say in response to my inquiry, they'd had no record of anyone else having an experience with gnome-type entities. They asked if they could publish my account in their forthcoming magazine and I replied that it was fine, on the condition that my identity not be disclosed. Some weeks later, the research group got in touch with me. They were astounded by the latest developments. They said the day before, a woman in Melbourne had phoned them. She'd been close to hysterical and claimed that gnome-type creatures had been running through her house for a few hours. Her adult daughter was present at the time, and the woman wanted someone to go to her house to rid them of the gnomes. The Queensland UFO Research Group said they told the woman they'd contacted someone closer to her about the situation, which they did. Apparently, the QLD group had contacted the Melbourne UFO Research Group and had given them the woman's contact info. In telling me this, the following day, the research group said it was impossible for the Melbourne woman to have known about my experience because the QLD Group magazine had been delivered to their printer mere hours before the Melbourne woman contacted them. In other words, the QLD magazine hadn't even been printed yet, let alone distributed. The group said they couldn't get over the coincidence, nor could they understand why both the Melbourne woman and I, as I live in Sydney, had contacted a group in Queensland. I said I had most probably contacted them because of my own experience, occurred in Queensland. I asked the group to forward me the details of the woman in Melbourne because I was eager to compare notes with her. She was the only other person I knew of who had experienced anything. But when the QLD group replied, it was to tell me that the Melbourne woman had told them she didn't want to be contacted, not by me or anyone else. The Queensland group told me this was often the case. They said people wanted help at the time, but once the situation was resolved, or they'd calmed down, they become afraid their experience will be reported in the media. They're afraid they'll be subjected to ridicule, generally, and particularly by those they know, such as neighbours and employers. My account was subsequently published in the magazine, 
in hard copy and online. My identity had not been revealed, and I've been identified only as C. Unfortunately, publication of my experience did not succeed in encouraging others to come forward. I am of Mexican descent, and in our culture, the dead and spirits are a big part of it, as you know by Dia de los Muertos. Now, as a kid, my family would always share ghost stories from the old country in Mexico. I would like to share a few, if you're interested. This one is from my grandma. She states that when she was a little girl, she saw the devil himself. Back then, circa 1940s, many families were poor, and I mean very poor. She lived in a poor village in Guerrero, and to go to the bathroom, you needed to take a nice trip into the forest, even at night, in pitch darkness, with only the stars and moon to guide you. She was peering, and when she walked back home, she heard what sounded like a parade of horses coming her way. Of course, that would not be possible, as it was pitch black. And no one traveled the roads at that time. That's when she saw a figure, mounted on one horse, and not many like she'd heard, and he did not look up. Just told her something and kept going, and then shortly disappeared. When she arrived home, her mother saw all her hairs standing on end. This, in her village, meant only one thing, contact with an evil presence. Another story she encountered was the famous weeping woman, La Llorona, in a similar situation while out in the woods at night. She said a woman, half white and half shadow, was walking down a dirt road while crying and giving out loud laments. You could not see her face, and she didn't seem to have any legs as she floated down the road. This story is from my parents. In Mexico and in other places in Latin America, there are many accounts of duendes, or gnomes, and evil-natured spirits such as nahuales, shapeshifters, which I suppose are similar to skinwalkers, and chaneques, forest imps, as well as hadas, fairies. My mother told me this story of her sister, who had a baby daughter. One night, my aunt was sleeping. They lived in a village where the forests are your backyard and she said she saw a little child walk around and making noise. She had a young son, but he was sleeping in his room. The girl was newborn and could not walk yet, so she had no idea who this child was. She called the child thinking it was her son, and it ran towards her room and darted under her bed. When she looked down getting ready to scold the child, as she thought it was her son playing into the late hours of the night, there's nothing there. In Mexico, it is believed that gnomes can take the souls of children, effectively ending their lives. This almost happened to my father. He was at his grandmother's house playing in the yard, and she had many trees. Bear in mind, this is when he was a kid, when suddenly, he saw a bunch of naked children on the top of a tree calling his name and gesturing him to climb up. He asked his grandma if he could play with the kids, but of course she saw nothing up there and held him inside because she knew what it was. She said some prayer, completely freaking out my dad, and said that he was not allowed to play there again. In another instance though, unfortunately, he was playing with his baby cousin, sitting in a baby chair, when suddenly his cousin just dropped her head like she had fallen asleep. But she hadn't fallen asleep. She had passed away. My dad called over his aunt, and when examining her, they found marks on her neck as if she had been strangled by an unseen force. My mother said that her father and neighbor were enemies, but there was something about this neighbor that scared the locals. There were many rumors and claims that he was a Nawa. This is because, when that home was sold, they found, hidden within, a book of spells, witchcraft, and Satanism, and had Nawal-related entries. The final story 
involves a ghost from the Mexican Revolution. My mother was a young girl. This is basically a repeat of my grandmother's story. She went out to use the bathroom in the late hours of the night, when she looked up and saw a man dressed in revolutionary clothing sitting upon a rock. No one was out at those times, and he had an old Mexican Revolution type sombrero and just looked into my mother's direction. But he had no face. He was just a silhouette. She got up as fast as she could and ran back inside. It is said in her village that a Mexican Revolutionary guerrilla soldier was executed in that spot, hung from a tree, and it was common in the times as most revolutionaries were either hung or had a firing squad shoot them as their execution. I dated a guy in high school whose family was from Norway. When he was 10, his family all went back to Norway in the summertime to stay at his mother's parents' farm. It was a working farm that was also attached to a large forest. David was told that he could go anywhere on the farm that he wanted, and into the forest, up some agreed-upon boundary no further line. Of course, being ten, he disobeyed, and went further into the forest. He was walking along, having found a path, when he started hearing someone yelling in Norwegian. He came around a bend, and found what he described as a gnome. The gnome was about the height of a four-year-old. He was adult, had a full beard, and his clothes looked handmade. He had the typical gnome-type hat. I'm pretty sure he said it was red, but I could be wrong. I do know that his suit was in light browns or greens, pretty much forest colours. The gnome was screaming at David in Norwegian, shaking his fists. David spoke Norwegian at home. But this form of Norwegian he couldn't really understand, although to him it sounded familiar enough for him to think that it was Norwegian. The thing that really had him flawed was that the gnome was buried up to his knees in the hard dirt path. He wasn't trying to pull himself out, so David did not think that he was stuck. It seemed to him that that was a normal thing for the gnome. David fled the scene and made it back safely to his grandpa's farm. When he got there, he sat down on a bench along the wall to catch his breath. His mum saw him running, and came and sat beside him. She said to him, You went too far into the woods, didn't you? He could only nod his head. At the time, he told me this. His mother had never said another word to him about it, and he never asked her about it either. It drove me crazy, and I bugged him to ask her more and more, but he never did. I've tried to find him online, as he has a very odd last name, but I never have. If I do, I'd like to ask him more questions about his mother, and the gnomes in the forest by their farm. My Encounter with the Fae This story is one of my first memories. It takes place either shortly before or shortly after my third birthday, that would be the last week in June 1980. My mum and I went to West Virginia to celebrate my birthday with her side of the family. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland at the time, so it wasn't too long of a trip. My mum's family lives in the small town of Shady Springs in Raleigh Country. Shady Springs is nestled in the lush forest of the Irish Mountain. One day, my cousin Leonard, who at the time was known as Eugene, decided that he would take me into the woods. I remember he had a rifle on his back, so I'm assuming he was hunting something. Raccoon or squirrel. Now, why my mum or the rest of the family allowed Leonard to take a three-year-old into the woods is beyond my comprehension. But I guess it's a different era. So Leonard took me into the woods, and we walked around for a while. I remembered being in awe of how massive it all seemed. Then again, everything seems larger to a three-year-old. I don't know how long we walked for, since children have a scrawny sense of time, but apparently I became tired or became a nuisance. 
my cousin Leonard decided to leave me sitting on a log while he continued wandering the woods. Really? You're going to leave a three-year-old alone in the woods when there are bears and snakes? Leonard, before this, used to torment me with stories about bears, which could explain my little fear about bears. So, Leonard left me alone in the woods. While I sat there for what felt like hours, I was starting to become afraid of the animal noises that were coming from deeper in the woods, and that just seemed to be getting closer. I had no idea how to get back to my grandparents' house, and I was just about to start crying when I looked over at a tree that was about 30 feet away. At the foot of the tree were some little men. I'm not talking dwarfs, more like the size of a squirrel. These men were sitting around the base of a tree and smoking pipes. They wore red hats and had beards. They were looking right at me. They must have realized I was frightened over the whole experience. They smiled and all pointed in one direction. I don't know why, but I decided to follow the direction they were pointing. It felt as if I were walking a very long time, but eventually I returned to my grandparents' house. I started yelling for my mum. She came outside and was shocked to see that I had come home without my cousin. She asked where he was, and I told her that he had left me alone in the woods. Needless to say, he heard about that from my mum, my grandparents, and his mother. It wasn't until years later that I told her about the little men who had pointed my way out of the woods. It wasn't until much later, when researching fairies, that I discovered that I was helped by gnomes, or some similar species to the gnome family. It was our second year in our new house in the suburbs, specifically in the Philippines, Cagayan de Oro City. I was eight years old when I first discovered that the thing I thought just exists in stories was actually true, and I experienced it. It was a Sunday afternoon when we were told to get our butts moving because we were going to go to the mall. I was excited and happy that after a long weekend, I could go to spend a day at the mall playing at the arcade. So normally I would get too excited and active. I took a shower and was so loud and noisy and little did I know stuff was about to hit the fan. I was asking my babysitter if she saw where my shirt was and she pointed it out to my left side. And when I tried to look towards where my shirt was, my head slowly tilted to the right. I didn't bother it at first, and naturally I tried to move my head straight, but, to my inconvenience, a very sharp pain took my neck, slowly and slowly. I couldn't do anything but tilt my head to the right. I shouted to everyone in the house for help, and my babysitter rushed to me. At first she thought I was joking, till she realized that I was in pain. So what we did was go to my grandma's sister to check on me, and she replied, Itim na duende. She was annoyed by my antics, that I was too noisy, so slapping me was enough to make me realize my rudeness. A duende is a dwarf like creature in Filipino folklore. From what I remember, there are two types of them the ones that are mostly good, and the evil types. And to my stupid luck, I pissed off one of the bad ones. After we visited my grandmother's sister, we eventually went into the mall. I ate KFC, and I specifically remember what I ate. It was spaghetti. I think they only served that in the Philippines, by the way. After that, we went home. A few days later, I can tilt my head a bit further to the other side, and look like a normal person again. My mum heard what happened to me, and told my babysitter to offer a black native chicken as a peace offering for my misdeeds. Then the day after, I was back to normal. After the encounter, we let our house be blessed by a Magnamont, a witch doctor, but specialising in healing instead of hurting. And nothing bad paranormal ever happened there again. Most newspapers, you know, publish strong, solid facts for the most part. While I was out in Mexico, I was reading a newspaper, and as I got to a few pages in, 
Did I read something shocking? This newspaper had published a paranormal account of a woman. Allegedly, she and her family were living in a house that her father owned many years ago. There was a well in the house, and it was well-known folklore that in that well, there resided creatures, fey, dwarves, call them what you will, but they lived there. So as the story goes, one day, for whatever reason, a member of the family disturbed the well, and since then, terrible happenings happened to the family. Stuff would go missing, children would get sick, animals would become terrified of going outside and misbehave. And generally, people were not having a good time, hearing disembodied voices and having night terrors, waking up screaming in the middle of the night. When her father came over to inspect the family, he realized that the well had been disturbed and that the creatures were coming out. This was terrible. By disturbing these ancient creatures, they had summoned havoc into their household and it wouldn't stop until the creatures were appeased. So they got together an offering, put it at the base of the well, and fixed the disturbance. And within a day or so, everything stopped, and the family went back to normal. Now this, of course, is an interesting experience to say the least. But the greater picture in question is the fact that it was published in a newspaper with an accompanying image of the well. Does this mean that folklore plays a greater part in some parts of the world, and things that people often dismiss as lies in other countries and cultures are considered and simply well known as true and out of our knowledge? This happened to my parents, and if anyone has any theories on what this could be, I'd love to hear from you. So basically right now, my family is living in the house my dad grew up in. One time, I asked my dad if he had any paranormal experiences, and after a bit of thinking, he remembered this story. When my dad was young, he said he woke up late in the night needing water, so he got up to go to the kitchen to get some. Right as he turned into the entrance of the kitchen, he looked in, and by the toaster he saw a little man of about 12 inches high, peering into the toaster. He described him as looking very old with white hair and a wrinkly face. As soon as the man noticed my dad, he disappeared, like there one second gone the next. My dad doesn't know how to explain it, other than maybe he imagined it. The next bit makes me think it might not have been his imagination. I asked my mum the same question if she had any previous paranormal experiences in the house. I kid you not, this is what she said. She said one morning she walked into the kitchen and by the toaster, which was on the other end of the counter from when my dad experienced this. There was a little old man. She said that when she saw him, he laughed and disappeared. My jaw kind of dropped, and I asked her to show me roughly how tall he was and she motioned 12 inches. At that point, I thought it was a joke, but I told her that my dad had a very similar experience, and she actually looked a little spooked. I asked if she had any knowledge of my dad's experience, and she said no. I then told my dad about it, and he thought I was making it up. They both had never told each other. After this whole thing, I researched about the little people, and came across the brownies, which are apparently house fairies. I don't know what to think of them though. I grew up in an old house in the south, kind of in the middle of nowhere. The house was laid out somewhat circular, as you could walk from the living room through most other rooms just by walking in a complete circle, and end up back where you started. When I was around five, me and my younger sister were chasing each other in circles while my mum cooked dinner. I was in front of her and we were laughing and carrying on. When we got into the dining room, in the inside corner, 
there was a small greenish creature with a dark cloak on. It had pointy ears that stuck out and sharp teeth. I was young, but it was still very small, so perhaps two feet. It looked kind of like it had been at the bottom of a pond, very old and tattered. It put its finger up to its lips and was grinning. I slammed to a stop and my sister was chasing so close that she ran right into me, which pushed us both into the corner, into the kitchen. We both started screaming, and my mum ran to us to see what was the matter, but the thing had gone. This has haunted me for years. I'm 25 now, and although I've done tons of research, I've never found anything that really fits what we saw. For a long time, I thought maybe I'd imagined it, if it weren't for my sister also seeing it, or my mum remembering our very real terror, I probably would have just written it off. Are there any ideas that you guys have of what this could be? There were lots of weird things happening in the house when I was young. Disembodied voices, things moving, very strange dreams. But that was obviously the weirdest and most unsettling. We still kind of talk about it from time to time, and it always makes us feel kind of yucky. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I now know I used to see as a child, when I was around seven or so. A gnome. It wouldn't even have been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up to my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard, a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the window sill outside. I'd sometimes see him in his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. Parents obviously always brushed it off as the silly nonsense kids come out with when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly. Ah, oh, you never did. Never pay any attention to them. Why would they? I even remember my father saying something to my mum like, we don't even have a garden gnome. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there till I was 18 or 19. I don't even think anyone in our street owned a garden gnome at all. He never even looked at me, like he didn't even know I was watching or perhaps he didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I've never spoken to it with anyone, but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked my mum, she still remembers me talking about it when I was little. I know that most people think that this is probably a load of rubbish, but I promise you it's true. Was he real? or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind. Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff, and on more than one occasion? Has this ever happened to anyone? Just so you know, this happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. When I was six, I was out back in my grandfather's house in the woods, and I had a small dog named Nova. Well, I was an outdoor child and hated playing inside, so I took my dog and went for walks in the woods. My grandfather has a shed right at the tree line. This time I decided to play to the right of the shed, maybe 10 feet away. My dog started growling over and there was a hole underneath it. So I assumed a groundhog lived there. I ignored him and continued playing. Then I heard a shuffling sound and looked over, and I swear to God I saw two short little dudes with little pointy hats on. I don't remember the colour of their clothes, but they were bright and very noticeable against the light blue shed. They stared at me and stopped moving when I saw them. Then I grabbed Nova and ran back to the house and never saw them again. But ever since I've had a ridiculous irrational fear of gnomes. It's so bad that I wouldn't go into my friend's house one time when I picked him up. I literally waited outside the car because I saw his mum had gnomes out front. It sounds silly, 
but I am now scared to death of them. I was around seven or eight, and every morning when I would wake, I would go into my grandma's room and lay in bed with her until she awoke. One morning, I go in and get the blankets and lay down with her. I look over and next to the dresser in front of the closet are two six to eight inch little men. I just stared at them frozen because I was terrified. I finally closed my eyes and hoped they would go away. I opened them up and they were gone. I've always wondered if what I saw was real, but I can picture it so vividly, like I can even remember what they were wearing. One had a red shirt, and the other had an orange shirt. I'm 30 now, and to this day I am profoundly terrified of garden gnomes, like panicky, sweaty, and racing heart kind of scared. Any idea what they could have been, or if I have a good reason to be afraid of them?